You know, do I sound any better? Yes, much better. Okay, cool. Good. So I think then, now that we, we did the sound check, we are, we are good to go. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, and greetings from Braunschweig, Germany, at least from Tobias and me. And good morning and good evening, wherever you may be. Um, Tobias, Bruce and I are, are super happy to have you all here in the virtual SecDev meeting room one. Um, and it's our great pleasure that, that you take the time to, to attend our tutorial, which is about correctness by con the, the correctness by construction approach to uh, programming using the Cork tool that we have developed. And um, the good news is there are no GitHub accounts to install. There's no Docker container to download or anything. Uh, we spent, spent some time um, and had some students implementing a web version of our Cork tool. It doesn't have quite all the features that the desktop uh, Cork version has, but it's, it's enough to play around and to give you a look and feel in the tutorial. Um, today to play a little bit uh, with Cork and we call that Web Cork and Tobias will introduce you to the web version then uh, as we go along. Um, and before we start off, um, um, I'd like to introduce you to my, my um, co-speakers today. Unfortunately, Luke can only join us in a little bit because he has um, some last minute childcare duties today, but um, Tobias and Bruce are with me. And um, Bruce, do you want to start? Sure, I don't have too much to tell other than what's already in the biography. So it's a real pleasure to have all of you here today. Um, so my background is uh, actually directly in this area of, of correctness by construction and related things in, uh, in software security, compilers, compiler construction, uh, and so on. And I'm affiliated to Stellenbosch University in South Africa and uh, have a couple of other affiliations as well. And uh, it's worth noting that a, a good chunk of my original uh, involvement in this was, was also through the university in Eindhoven, which uh, is where Luke uh, is. Thanks very much, Ina. Cool, thanks. Tobias. Hi, I'm Tobias Runger. I am a PhD student at Tu Braunschweig in Ina's group. And yeah, today I will guide you through the WebCork tutorials, examples, and yeah, let's see how that's going. Yeah, and my name is Ina Schäfer. I'm a professor of software engineering at TU Braunschweig, um, and my group works on, on formal methods and integrating them into software engineering and correctness by construction is a topic that's very dear to our heart, and you will see lots of that um, during the course of the tutorial. Um, so let me, let me start with giving you an idea what we are talking about um, in this tutorial. And um, the, then I will briefly show you the agenda and the plan for the, for the three hours that we want to spend with you. So as you probably all know that there is correctness critical software and in the context of, um, of SecDev, there's not only correctness critical software, but also security critical software. And of course we have standards for automotive and aviation and medical. Um, and usually what we do is we um, use post hoc testing, um, also security testing. Um, sometimes we use formal verification, um, but usually this is um, all very expensive. Um, so um, if, if we look at software development projects, you, are, you might probably well be aware that more than half of the money that is spent on a software engineering project usually goes into testing and quality assurance. And this is a point that we want to address uh, with this line of work. Um, so the alternative to doing extensive post hoc testing of a product um, that we would like to, to lobby for, advocate in this tutorial is correctness by construction. And the main idea is there's a German saying that the pick doesn't get heavier just by weighing it, but a pick gets fatter um, if, you, if you feed it well. Um, and so this is also the idea that we, that we pursue in correctness by construction, that we want to start with the properties, the correctness properties that we want to build into um, the program um, in form of a pre and post condition specification. And that we then develop the program and correctness annotations in sync 
Um, and we use these annotations to, to then kickstart postdoc verification and testing. But the main idea of correctness by construction is not to, to hack something um, together and then um, test it into correctness, but to build a correct software system from the start. Um, and this is then the, the agenda um, for, for the morning session here. So I will, I will start you off with some formal foundations of CBC. Unfortunately, um, we will need a little bit of first order logic and we need a little bit of a programming language um, to play with. So I will introduce you to that. And then um, Tobias and Bruce and uh, Luke, if we can join us later, uh, will take turns on introducing you to simple and more advanced examples of programs that are correct, uh, constructed with CBC. Um, and they will take turn, turns um, explaining that theoretically. And then we do a hands-on session and you are all very um, warmly invited to, to join Tobias then on the hands-on part, part and play around with WebCork. Um, and then towards the end of the tutorial, we will also show you the connection to, to more security related correctness properties. So the classical form of, of CBC um, that we will spend on the, the first two thirds of the tutorial is classical functional correctness. Um, but in recent work, um, Tobias and I and co-authors have worked on information flow by construction. So we were not only constructing um, a functionally correct program, but where we also build confidentiality and integrity properties into the same program um, and arrive at a program that is not only functionally correct, but also secure in a specific sense. Um, and to finish off, if there's still time left, um, I, will, I will show you some aspects, uh, further aspects of CBC, how it relates to postdoc verification um, and other lines of work that we are currently doing. And of course, you are super welcome. Um, and I would like to encourage you to, to ask questions. So um, there is plenty of room for your questions. Um, and I think probably the easiest is if you write the question into chat and um, then uh, we, we read the questions out and, and try to answer them. Um, of course, please be aware that um, we are being recorded, so um, we try to not read out names of people in chat so that you won't be um, on the recording if you don't want to. Um, and if we have time towards the end, then we can also have a round where you can actively ask questions. Tobias Bruce, anything logistically that I have forgotten so far? Nothing I can think of. Okay, it's then. Capture it all. <laughs> Then um, let's, let's start. So where, where did the whole work on correctness by construction start? And this gentleman, um, you might know him, is um, Edsger Dijkstra, who has written a book already in the early 70s, A Discipline of Programming. Um, and there's this interesting quote that it's worthless for the working programmer, but great for the computer scientist. And we try to prove you wrong that um, the, the general idea of correctness by construction as advocated by, by Edsger Dijkstra and Eindhoven um, is actually also something that a working programmer should know and must know. Um, and maybe one side remark. So usually my students um, get a bit panicky once we start putting math on a slide and, and logics and formal reasoning, um, but they like testing. Um, and in the Agile community, there's the idea around on, on test-driven development, uh, where you write your test case and then you write your program. Um, and if you don't like formal stuff um, so much, then you can also think of this original idea of correctness by construction by Dijkstra as a formal way of doing test-driven development. Test-driven development, you start with your tests and then you write your program until the tests pass. Um, and in CBC, you start with your correctness specification and you build your program um, to satisfy that specification. Um, and then following um, the, the original work by Dijkstra, there are other works on correctness by construction, for instance, by David Rees or Carol Morgan. And to the right on this slide, there's the book that Bruce and Derek co-authored, um, which came from years and years of lectures and lecture notes 
on teaching um, computer science students uh, correctness by construction. Um, and this, this book is also um, the, the, the text more or less that we follow in this tutorial. Um, and if you can get, if you are interested in this copy and uh, in this, um, in, in this work and want to dig a little deeper, then um, I can recommend getting a copy of that book as well. Okay, so what is CBC in the setting that we pursue here? Um, and, and maybe a disclaimer, there are other approaches that call themselves correctness by construction or C by C, um, but we are focusing on that, that Dijkstra line of work that we want to construct a program or an algorithm uh, from a specification by using a set of refinement rules or so-called correctness preserving transformations. Um, and um, maybe let me add here also that we believe that this approach to, to constructing programs is specifically well suited um, to, to complex algorithmic problems. Um, and unfortunately we don't have the time um, to, to introduce you to like the really complex stuff. Um, but in the book um, and in also on, on the website for our tool, you find more complex algorithms that are then correct by construction. Um, we look at imperative programs in this work uh, just to make things simple. So we take a guarded command language um, and we use first order predicate logic over program variables um, to specify the properties. Um, current work, ongoing work um, in my group um, is on the, the second uh, release, the second version Quark 2.0, where we then also add object orientation, but for, for simplicity, we leave it at, at just classical algorithms, um, single functions, procedures, or methods in a class. So this is our very simple guarded command language. Uh, we only have six commands. And that, as, as we know from, um, you might know from your theoretical computer science classes where you taught, where they ta taught you ev everything you, you didn't even want to know about computability actually means that with these um, six commands, we can build everything that is uh, computable. So this is a very simple Y language. Um, we have the, um, the empty command, uh, a skip, uh, we have a chaotic command, the abort command, um, then we have an assignment, so we can assign values to variables, we can also use some form of expressions here, um, then we have a sequence, so we can put two statements um, after one another. Um, then we have an if statement where we can say, if a condition is true, then we execute um, a, a chunk of code. And then we have a repetition um, and this is called do here. Uh, we could also call it while or loop. Um, and this, this means essentially, as long as the loop guard is true, then we want to execute the loop body. And we also have comments um, just to make our life easier. So this is a very simple Y language um, from the textbook. Um, and now then the next main ingredient um, that I should tell you about is how we specify properties of our programs. And this is what you, what you see here. So we are using whore triple, whore triples, um, which essentially capture a precondition, which says, which describes the program state before we start executing um, a, a chunk of code or, or our program. Um, then we have the, the program itself. So here it's the, the capital S is the program. And optionally we can annotate what kinds of variables the program is, um, is about, which variables the program is manipulating. Um, and then we have um, a post condition which describes um, the, the properties of the program state after execution. And in general, um, we use the, the whore triples to, um, to specify requirements for the program. So whenever we start a pro the program in a program state satisfying P, the precondition, then we want to arrive in a final state after executing the program 
um, where the post condition Q holds. And of course, as you may guess, there are multiple instances, multiple programs that satisfy the same specification. Um, and we will come to that in, in the course of the tutorial, that also this way of CBC constructing um, programs tells us a little bit about different algorithmic choices that we can make um, for solving the same problem. Um, and one thing, um, I brushed a bit under the rug um, when I now introduced um, core triples is that of course we, we sometimes worry also about termination. Um, and in, in the whole logic world, there's, there's the distinction between total and partial correctness. Um, and um, total correctness says that this pre post condition specification PSQ or this four triple PSQ is true if and only if the following holds. If um, the, the precondition is true and we execute the program, then we guarantee that uh, the program S will terminate and that the post condition is also true. So in total correctness, we also have to prove that a program terminates. Um, and in partial correctness, we are assuming only that the program terminates. So we say, if we, if we take the partial correctness notion, um, we say that the whole triple PSQ is true, if and only if um, the following holds, if the precondition pre is true and we execute as end as terminates, then Q will also be true. So in partial correctness, we do not say anything about non-terminating or abruptly uh, terminating executions, but we just, just ignore that. Um, total correctness is um, especially interesting if we are looking at programs that have loops. Um, and when I will introduce you to the rule for constructing a loop, we will talk a little bit about um, total correctness, or we will talk a little bit about how to prove termination of loops. So before I start with the general approach to BS, are there any questions so far in Slack or in chat? I don't see any yet. Okay. So then what's, what's the general idea of, of this CBC work? We start with a or triple PSQ here, where S is an abstraction of code, as the slide says, or an abstract statement, or we could put it in a way saying, like, do what I think. Um, so I want this to make this contract true, starting in a program state satisfying P. I want to write a program, build a program, such that afterwards Q holds. Um, and in, in our CBC approach, we start iteratively refining um, this abstract statement S by more concrete statements. Um, and um, we replace certain parts of this abstract program with concrete code in guarded command language commands. Um, there might still be abstract parts left and we apply the rules as you will also see in the examples um, so long until we don't have um, any more um, abstract statements le left and we have um, arrived at a concrete guarded command language program. Um, this is called C here, it's just a, a variable for program. And then this program C, which is guarded command language, um, a concrete program is guaranteed to satisfy the specification. And why is that so? Um, this is uh, point four here. So all the refinement rules, when they are applied correctly, they won't destroy um, the specification. But if you, if you apply the uh, refinement rules correctly, then um, they preserve the correctness of the specification, even though the program is moving from abstract to more concrete. Um, and for that, of course, we need to know what rules uh, we can apply and how we can refine a program from abstract to concrete. Um, and this is what I'm, what I'm showing you now, how the refinement rules look like. So we start with um, the whole triple PSQ here. And the first refinement rule talks about introducing a skip statement. So skip statement is essentially one which does nothing. 
So we are allowed to replace this abstract program S up here by a skip, skip statement if the precondition P already implies the post condition Q. This is what is written here. And we call the part after this if and only if, we usually call that site condition or verification condition. Um, and those are the conditions that we have to ensure for the refinement rules to be correctness preserving. So we can replace an abstract statement by a do nothing statement if the precondition implies the post condition. Um, and that actually captures our natural intuition of what a, what a skip, skip statement should do. Then um, another more interesting rule is um, the rule that allows us to, to introduce an assignment. So when are we allowed to replace an abstract statement S by an assignment? Um, the assignment is here just sort of a placeholder assignment. We assign a variable X to an expression E. Um, and when are we allowed to do that? Um, usually if you are familiar with uh, Hoare logic, you, you would have seen a backwards reasoning way where you would replace all occurrences um, of, um, of the variable by the expression, and then you could, could reason in a weakest precondition fashion. Here, we decided um, to do forwards reasoning because we think that's a little bit more intuitive. So we are, a, we are allowed to uh, replace an abstract statement uh, by an assignment if, the precondition implies the post condition where in the post condition we have actually um, executed the assignment. So we have um, replaced X in, in the uh, respective places. And that also intuitively just captures um, the semantics of an assignment. Of course, we do want to um, to build more complex programs that uh, consist of more than one assignment statement. So we need to be able to construct sequences of statements. Um, and this is the third rule, which talks about composition. So we are allowed to replace this abstract statement S by a composition of two statements, S1, S2, if we can find an intermediate condition, and this is called M here, such that the first Hoare triple is P S one M and the second Hoare triple M S two Q um, are constructed and we can show that both of them hold. So essentially, if we apply this rule recursively or iteratively more and more often, it allows us to construct arbitrarily uh, long sequences of statements. And the only condition when we can do that is every time we introduce a sequence, um, we, um, we can find an intermediate condition, an intermediate predicate that is of, a sim of the same form as the pre and post condition. Um, and we can make then the two corresponding Hoare triples true. Um, and, and usually, as you will see in the examples, it's pretty clear from um, the structure of the pre or the post condition and the statement you want to introduce uh, what that intermediate condition might be. So next step, um, we, we also want to um, introduce if conditions. And um, I will walk you through this syntax, which looks a little bit odd maybe. So we are allowed to replace um, this abstract statement S by this if statement here, um, if a certain set of side condition holds. Um, and um, the the if condition here says, um, so it's like, it, it's more like a switch statement. Um, so if the guard G1 is true, then I execute the set of statements S1, else if, if the guard GN is true, then I execute SN. So this is actually a big sort of cascading if statement. Um, what we will need for the examples are just if, if statements and if else statements. So we are allowed to replace the abstract statement by this if statement if, first of all, the precondition has to imply the um, disjunction of the guards, uh, which means that um, 
from the precondition, we must make sure that there is at least one, um, one guard that becomes true that we can execute. And then additionally, we um, need to ensure that the precondition and the guard of the, of the if statement, of the if, um, if statement um, conjoined um, and then executing um, the set of statements in that, in that case um, make the post condition true. So essentially this is another whole triple that we then construct for each um, case in that if statement. Um, and you also see one of the principles already um, that this is, yeah, I would say divide and conquer or classical recursion that from the big abstract unknown program, um, we, by, by stepwise refinement, we bring in more and more concrete stuff and we are left with smaller unknown parts like this SI here. Um, and then we need to construct SI in the next step such that we ensure um, this resulting whole triple here. Good, now life becomes a little bit more interesting. We are talking about loops um, and the idea of loop invariance. Um, and as I said, um, if we want to verify total correctness, or if we want to construct programs that are totally correct, we also have to reason about the loops and loop termination. Um, and of course, classically, there are two, two ways to reason about loops. Um, and you could, of course, do loop unrolling. So you execute the loop body once and then twice and then three times. The main problem is that um, usually we do not, do not know in advance how often a loop is, is executed. Um, so the second main idea to reason about loops um, is using loop invariants. And you can think of a loop invariant as a summary of the effect that a loop body has. Um, and I remember from my first year um, programming lectures when we were introduced to whole logic that I never knew how a, a loop invariant would be structured and where um, magically it appeared uh, in other people's homeworks. Um, but hopefully um, Tobias and Bruce can show you for the examples that we, we are um, working through with you that, that finding a loop invariant is far less um, miraculous or, or mystic than, than I thought as a student. So think of a loop invariant as, the, um, as a summary of the effects of the loop. Um, and then we use um, the loop invariant to replace the loop body in reasoning. Um, so here on this slide, where's my laser pointer? Um, you see um, a while loop. And here it's, it's a little bit of an interesting while loop because it has also multiple cases. Um, and, and for the time being, we can essentially ignore everything below here, but we just stick with the first case. Um, um, and if we only have do G1 implies S1 odd, this is a classical while loop, which has a loop guard G1 um, and then a loop body S1. Um, and we say, that um, a, loop, um, a loop invariant needs to be, um, needs to be true in, um, in three places. So first of all, we have to make sure that the loop invariant holds before we start the loop. Then we have to make sure that the loop invariant is preserved by each iteration of the loop. And then after executing the loop, um, the loop invariant is of course true again, um, because it was true before, it was preserved by um, every loop iteration. So by every execution of, of the loop body. Um, and then after executing the loop, we know that um, the loop invariant still holds, that the negation of the loop guard holds because otherwise we wouldn't have left the loop. And from those two facts, the loop invariant and the negation of the guard, we should then be able um, to, um, to deduce that the, the post condition of the loop holes. 
Um, and so, so this is the idea how we, we generally deal with, uh, with functional correctness of loop. Uh, of loops by using loop invariance as a summary structure and by replacing the effects of the loop uh, by that loop invariant. Um, and keep this idea in mind uh, when I will show you the, the refinement rules for uh, refinement rule for introducing the loop in a bit. Um, and first, we also need to talk about when um, a loop terminates. Um, and for that, we, we use a construct that we call a loop variant. Um, so we have the loop invariant and the loop variant that is for, for termination. And with an integer expression or, yeah, an integer expression, um, and we call that V um, in, in this slide deck, um, is a loop variant if, um, or, or let me put it differently. So in general, a, a loop variant is an integer expression that is monotonically decreasing in each iteration of the loop, and that is bounded from below. Um, and this is essentially also what's um, on this slide. So we say that um, the loop variant V is decreasing in each loop iteration, where V zero is, is the, the value before, um, executing one iteration of the loop body. So it's decreasing and it's bounded from below. Um, usually any, any bound um, suffices, but um, in most cases we simplify our lives and just say, okay, uh, we, we uh, take it as bounded by zero. So, and of course, if you, if you think about it, you have an integer expression that is decreasing in every loop iteration and that is bounded from below, so by zero, then of course the loop cannot be executed infinitely many times. Um, and, and that's then our argument why we make sure that um, a loop terminates. Um, and here you have a small example. So we have, um, we initialize a variable i with 10, um, and then we have this uh, very simple loop, which says that as long as i is greater than zero, then we decrease i. Um, and of course here, um, i is the variant of the loop. And why is that? Because i decreases in every loop iteration. We can plainly see that here. And i is bounded by, from below by, by zero. So um, we can, uh, proof that um, the, this, this very simple loop terminates. And now with, um, with those two ideas about loop invariance and loop variance, we can actually um, come up with a refinement rule that allows us to replace an abstract statement S here by um, um, a while loop. And um, the while loop here is um, the guard G and then the loop body S. And here we have to come up with a loop invariant and a loop variant. So that's the main sort of constructive or creative process um, that if we want to replace um, a program S by a, by a loop, then we need to make sure that we know what the invariant is. And we also provide a variant in order to ensure that the loop uh, will terminate. And for the, the loop invariant and the loop variant, we also have, have side conditions that correspond to the general ideas of, of loop invariants and variants. So first of all, the precondition has to imply the invariant. Um, this is the first case, uh, which says that the invariant has to be true before the loop. Then um, this is the case after the execution of the loop, the invariant and the negation of the guard should imply the post condition um, such that we can then move on uh, with, with our program construction. And third case, um, this is the loop body preserves invariant case. So the invariant and the loop guard and then executing as uh, reestablishes the loop invariant. Um, and those are the three things that we need for, fun, uh, for, for just partial correctness and for total correctness. We also need to show that in every iteration of the loop body, um, the loop variant indeed decreases and that the loop variant is bounded from below. 
And um, this might now look a little bit complex and a little bit too formal, but you will see in the examples that uh, once you have the idea for, for finding the invariant, following this refinement law is not too difficult. Um, and then um, those are the, the uh, five main rules that we need to introduce a skip statement, an assignment, a composition, an if statement, and uh, a loop. Um, and we have um, an additional rule, actually two additional rules, uh, which allow us to logically play with um, pre and post conditions. This sometimes comes in handy um, if we want to simplify things. So here we have a whole triple P S Q and we can refine that to a whole triple P prime S Q if P implies Q. So we are allowed to weaken the precondition. And we also have the dual rule for, for post conditions. So a whole triple P S Q can be refined to a whole triple P S Q prime if um, the, the post condition Q prime implies Q so we can strengthen the post condition and that's indeed sometimes helpful. And then we also have the, the possibility to introduce subroutines or, or method calls in that sense. So we can um, replace an abstract statement S by a subroutine or by a method call. Um, and we have um, the subroutine specified here and it has a contract P prime Q prime. And we can call the sub subroutine um, in, in this place between the pre and post condition P and Q if the preconditions are equal and the post conditions are, are equal as well. And of course, together with the, the two rules before that, so weakening uh, preconditions, strengthening post conditions, you can, of course, also um, replace um, or call a subroutine uh, which has a, a different contract. And this actually then amounts to the Liskov um, substitution principle that uh, preconditions of called methods can only be weakened and postconditions can only be strengthened. And with that, you, you already have all the necessary ingredients um, for, for doing CBC in, in the Dijkstra style. Um, and, and one last um, thing before I hand over, is of course that this way of constructing uh, programs by applying refinement rules um, also shows you um, that you can do different things with the same whole triple. So here you can replace S either by a composition or by an if statement or by, um, by a while, while loop. Um, and uh, we may arrive at the point where we can also discuss that, that this way of, of CBC uh, based program development gives you an idea of what algorithmic choices you have for solving the same problem and then gives rise to, to what we call uh, taxonomies of algorithmic families. So to, to conclude this first part on, on foundations of CBC, um, what, what, what should you take with? So I have introduced you to whore triples for program specification or contracts um, as they would be called in, in the, the Eiffel world. Um, I have um, shown you the, the refinement rules for assignment, selection um, and repetition and for skip, um, but that was, um, uh, that's actually the, the do nothing rule. Um, and then I've shown you the refinement rules for weakening preconditions, strengthening postconditions, and um, some program logic rules and the subroutine rule. And with that, um, we do a little switch here, I think. Um, Tobias, are there, are there questions so far? Um, no, not, okay. in not here in the Zoom meeting. Good, then I stop my slide share and hand over to you. Cool, thanks very much. Uh, Tobias, uh, thanks so much, Tobias. I appreciate it. Can everyone see me? Yep. And can yeah. everyone hear Not me okay? 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, uh, amongst the co-presenters, of course, if something happens again with my microphone, please feel free to uh, to pop up a hand and, and stop me that uh, we stop uh, immediately and I fix that problem. So thanks very much for the introduction. I think it lays all of the groundwork. Uh, interestingly, no questions, which um, is a good sign. But of course, I, I think for many of the participants, it's also first thing in the morning. So it's, uh, you know, maybe not entirely surprising that the questions haven't arisen yet. Um, I would encourage you nonetheless, also because we're changing gears here a little bit with a different speaker, um, perhaps uh, hopefully not much of a change in terminology, but you never know. Um, if there are questions that arise, um, I would suggest maybe asking them uh, immediately, of course, in the Slack channel. And Tobias is kindly uh, monitoring that, um, uh, you know, as well, I think, uh, as we go. So um, there are three little examples that I'm going to be covering. And um, these examples, um, I think for many of the people in the, in the audience who are programmers or software engineers, you, you'll probably immediately guess that, well, these are, are trivially easy to get right. Um, the reason we explain them is that they actually um, elaborate or elucidate on, on some of the um, underlying concepts. So it's useful to actually run through them, even if they're things that you could actually code with your eyes closed. Um, we don't move on to covering something like binary search, which is a very nice uh, next example that actually matches up with linear search. And that one becomes very interesting because there we typically see people making classical mistakes off by one errors um, or a, a slight mistake in the comparison um, that's needed within the, the loop of the, uh, of the binary search. But nonetheless, let me dive into uh, a couple of the examples here. The first one is, of course, linear search. And um, Tobias has very kindly already um, thrown exactly what I need up on the up on the slide, but there's something I want to show you beforehand, and that is a very quick uh, visual demonstration of binary search. Sorry, binary search, uh, linear search. So all of you are, are very familiar with how we proceed with linear search. I'll make a couple of assumptions that I'm just going to demonstrate something with a deck of cards here, um, and I'm not making the assumption that the deck of cards is sorted in any way, but I am making the assumption that it's a non-empty deck of cards. So there's at least one card in the deck. And I'm also making the assumption that the card I'm looking for appears somewhere in this deck of cards. So we don't have an illegal situation where I'm asking for a, a card that doesn't appear anywhere in the deck of cards. I'll also simplify it a little bit because I did say already that it's not a sorted deck. I'll simplify it by saying I'm going to search linearly from the front to the back, and I'm going to proceed as follows. I'm basically going to loop, iterate in other words, have this do loop as uh, we've just seen, and I'm going to move from one to the next. And every time that I see that at the point where my thumb is, the card I'm looking for does not appear, I can move my thumb one card lower. And I see again that it doesn't appear there and I can move my thumb one card lower. Again, I see that it doesn't appear. So after some number of iterations, I've wound up in a situation that looks something like this. where we have got some portion of the deck of cards above my thumb and some portion of the cards below my thumb. And of course, I'm going to again consider whether the card I'm looking for is the one that's at my thumb and if not, move on. But before we discuss um, you know, the details of writing out this algorithm, what's instructive about this particular example is that we can immediately see the corresponding invariance and variance that we've been discussing as well. So in this particular case, the invariance um, are the following. We've got actually two clauses to the invariant. Um, not, not all of them are, are equally interesting in, in, in such cases. So we also make a few simplifications. But the one clause is to say, in this portion of the deck that we've actually looked at already, in other words, the ones above my thumb, the card that I'm looking for definitely does not appear there. And furthermore, the card that I'm looking for actually does appear in this portion of the deck that's below my thumb. So with those two, uh, two clauses, we actually have a complete picture of what's going on and how far we've searched through the deck of cards. The other thing that we can say is state a variant. And uh, as you've seen already, the variant is a, an integer function. If you're a very pragmatic kind of programmer, uh, one way to view it is basically a countdown timer of, of, of sorts or a countdown um, device of sorts. And we simply have, uh, have to keep track of how many cards are below my thumb. And that gives us the worst case scenario for the number of cards that still need to be considered, considered before we actually uh, either terminate or run into the card we're looking for. And thanks to the fact that I guaranteed that the card I'm looking for is in the deck of cards, we know that we won't run off the deck of cards. So you can see already that some of these things interlock in providing us assurances of, of correctness. So let's return now to writing this out in guarded command language. Um, and as you've seen, this is a, a very elegantly simple language. For those of you old enough to uh, have programmed in Pascal, 
uh, will recognize that it has many uh, similarities to Pascal. There's virtually no boilerplate within the code. Um, you will have, have seen um, in the in very small examples that there typically are not declarations and things along those lines. Nonetheless, those things are not necessarily important because we're dealing with relatively smaller snippets of code and uh, and showing that those are correct. So let's start with uh, with the slide here that, uh, that Tobias has given us. Uh, basically, we've got an array A, so that was our deck of cards. And within this array A, we don't really care what type it is, by the way. It's indexed by, uh, by integers, unsigned integers. We start with zero. Um, uh, and of course, we could modify all of this for programming languages that don't start with zero or languages like uh, Python that deal with uh, array slices and so on. But nonetheless, we've got an array A indexed uh, starting from zero. And we're interested in finding the index at which the element X appears. So X is the one that we're actually looking for. We make the assumption that I already mentioned with the deck of cards that we um, know that we will find X somewhere in the array A. And in fact, we may actually find it multiple times. And we're not really bothered which of the, the particular instances we find if it appears uh, several times within the array. So that's no problem as well. We um, don't have a preferred um, I uh, at which it appears in other words. Thanks Tobias. So how do we write this down a little bit more formally? Um, there's a, a very, very minor mistake in this slide. I'll just point out to you as we, uh, as we go. Um, but we would like to actually state the precondition for this algorithm um, in such a way that we've uh, got a few notational shortcuts. And the intention there on the first line next to the precondition um, in boldface is to then introduce a predicate which uh, gives us a, a simpler way of stating that. So this predicate um, app, which is actually short for appears, says that X appears within the array A somewhere from K to L, not inclusive of L. So this is very important. And then to the right of the, um, um, the equals, we have the there exists uh, statement. So basically we're saying there exists some I, some index I at which it appears. And that index I we're assuming in this particular case to fall from K up to L, but not including L. So that's why there's a mis mismatching square bracket and then a, a curved bracket parenthesis on the right side of the, the L. Um, so this is a nice notational shorthand, which will allow us to express a couple of other important things. And going back to the deck of cards, you know, just as a reminder, um, app basically says, well, we know that there will be some point at which it appears within the array and we can actually bound it uh, thanks to this K and L in this particular example. So the post condition, the desired state after this, uh, this algorithm terminates is that we have actually done something that arrives at I such that A subscript I is equal to X. So we've actually found the index at which it occurs. The complete algorithm uh, specification, if you will, is what you see on the bottom line there. So the algorithm specification starts out with our, our precondition and the precondition says, well, we assume somewhere from index zero up to the length of A, not including um, that, that length of A element, which is actually one past the end of the array. Somewhere in that stretch of the array, we know that X will appear. So that's one of the assumptions we made initially as well. And then we have um, the fact that we're looking for a statement S. This is the part of the algorithm that we intend to derive using CBC. And um, we have I stated in there, the I followed by colon says that we're gonna come up with a statement S and we intend to manipulate the variable I and it's kind of an implicit contract that we don't intend to mess with X or with the array A. So in a sense, those two are, are immutable for the purposes of this algorithm. Uh, we don't necessarily have to uh, conform to that, but it's a nicety in writing things down in terms of CBC. And then our post condition is of course that we have eventually found X at uh, subscript I within the array. So there we go, we have a specification and we can move on to now refining that specification. Sorry, Tobias, thank you. Um, before we do that, this is a nice um, uh, pictorial, perhaps not as nice as me using the playing cards, but this is a nice pictorial way of also picturing what's going on within the array. For this particular example, just to make things a little bit more interesting, we've decided to proceed from the right side of the array to the beginning of the array. So this is of course very uh, non-conformant. All of you will have coded linear search and I think all of us in real life would actually code it from uh, front uh, to back in the array. But just to make things a little bit interesting, we're coding it so that it goes from the back of the array to the front of the array. And that allows us to say a couple of interesting things. In particular, we basically got the split within the array as we did in the playing cards. And uh, the split says that 
There's a whole back portion of the array where we are guaranteed that X does not occur because we've actually taken a look there. And then of course, there's the front part of the array, the part that's um, shaded in gray, where we know that X must occur somewhere in there. And of course we know that it must occur because we've examined the rest of the array and also because we assume that our, um, our precondition held, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this entire exercise. Now, a couple of interesting observations. Um, the fact that X does not occur in that unshaded portion of the array is what we can actually write directly above there. So we're saying that it does not appear from I plus one all the way up to the end of the array. Okay, so the not is that uh, little turnstile there. For those of you that are from uh, a pure software engineering background, uh, the turnstile symbol in front of the app is, uh, is simply the not symbol. So most of us write that uh, coding wise as a bang, as an exclamation mark. And that's something that we're gonna use as our invariant. So as we're proceeding, we actually are doing things in a way that we are guaranteed that that invariant remains true. The other nicety that we get out of this is because we're going from the right to the left, we can simply use I, our index, as being our variant, okay? And we know this variant cannot underrun, so we'll get to uh, element zero if we have to, if it's the very, very last uh, element that we actually find in the array and we won't go below zero. So we don't have a possibility of underrunning. And um, this would allow us to then code this algorithm in, for example, C um, using unsigned integers, uh, although it's probably not a smart idea. Anyway, it's probably always a good idea to use signed integers unless you're very, very constrained. Um, so that was a, a, let's say a strategic uh, choice to go from right to left. And it has uh, allowed us to, to very elegantly state the, the variant and the invariant as well. Uh, one more thing, just very briefly about this picture. If you take a look at the index I plus one, that is very, very carefully placed just to the right of the shaded portion. So we're being very explicit here that from I plus one up to the end of the array, we know that it doesn't appear. And of course, you know, one of the tricks that uh, we need to, to play here is teasing out the uh, the actual loop in such a way that we um, that we can write down the, uh, the guard of the loop and then uh, the body of the loop as well. Thank you, Tobias. So now we get into uh, the slightly more tangled looking um, uh, formalisms of this, but we're not going to uh, necessarily give you all of the deep, deep details of the notation. Uh, you've covered enough of it in the, the early slides, but we're going to move from one line to the next via a sequence of refinements, um, as you've already uh, heard. And the way these refinements proceed is from the, uh, the black text, um, mathematical looking text to the next uh, black text by one of these refinement operators. So that's the, uh, the square subset equal operator for those of you that, uh, that type in LaTeX. And the thing that you see in blue there, which is hopefully visible on everyone's screen is what's known as a hint. Uh, the hints in this particular case happen to be in curly braces as well, uh, which is a little bit unfortunate because it's not intended that they are then part of a precondition or post condition but the hints are there merely to actually be persuasive to you as to why we were able to make that refinement. And uh, there are a couple of places that, uh, that use this notation, admittedly a somewhat non-standard notation, but it allows you to then sprinkle the development of the algorithm um, with various comments as we, as we proceed as well. So from the first line to the, um, to the next black line, uh, the third physical line means that we're taking our initial specification and we're going to augment the initial specification by simply adding in another conjunct or another clause onto the, uh, the post um, condition. And that clause is to say, well, um, the, the fact that we would like a subscript i to be equal to x is essentially the same as saying that the invariant holds and additionally a subscript i is equal to x. Okay, so if we actually were to then elaborate the, the details of the invariant, we'd actually see that coming out as well. But nonetheless, from the, from the first line to the next uh, black um, line, it's simply the addition of that conjunct. The next one is a little bit more interesting. And we've seen a, an example in these skeletons about how to elaborate into a loop, uh, essentially an idiom or a design pattern that you're gonna see much more often when, uh, when it's necessary to, necessary to introduce a loop. So we already have the invariant and uh, we'll move on to that, that third black line by introducing statement two, which is going to actually be the loop in the future. And that's why it's got the invariant in front of it and the invariant behind it and that additional uh, conjunct. 
And what's in front of that is another statement, which in this case is called init. And it's called init for a reason, because we would actually typically like to have um, some small piece of code which establishes the invariant initially. So init is not itself going to be a loop. It's typically actually some very tiny uh, assignment or set of assignments which establish the, the various index variables so that the loop will run correctly. And um, init will, of course, also have to manipulate um, a variable i uh, necessarily. And then finally, to the very last line that we have, we already know that the easiest way to establish the invariant is to simply initially set i to be the very last um, index of the array, which is a.len minus one. So in other words, we're indexing the very end of the array. Now, why do we know that the invariant is true in that particular case? Well, it's certainly the case that everything from the right side of the array uh, further to the right, which is actually an empty array, it's certainly the case that the, uh, the element X that we're looking uh, for does not appear within that empty piece of the array. And, um, and, and we therefore have actually correctly initialized I so that we can proceed from right to left. Uh, Ina, do we see any questions unfolding or Tobias? Failing which, uh, please feel free to go to the next slide. I don't see any yet. Okay, thanks very much. Um, so now we can actually very explicitly introduce the loop structure. And um, this, uh, the very top line that you see there is essentially the, the tail end of what we'd seen on the previous slide. So now we're just refining the part that will become the loop. We already know that we've established the invariant uh, thanks to that uh, initialization of I. Uh, we've got statement S2, and we know that after S2, we need to also have the invariant be true. And additionally, this other, um, uh, this other thing, and those two things together will ensure that we um, have established the post condition. So the great news is if you take a look back at, uh, and now I uh, fail to remember precisely which slide it was, but um, this would be roughly um, slide 17 to 20, somewhere in that ballpark in the introduction that you already had, you will recognize that um, the first line there is a way of recognizing that we have the invariant and we also have the guard. And uh, to be more precise, we've actually got the negation of the guard. Um, so the negation of the guard is a subscript i is equal to x. And that means the guard is simply um, a subscript i is not equal to x. And that allows us in one move to introduce the loop. And the loop is a very simple while loop. And it basically says while uh, the element that we're looking for is not the one at index i, do something, and of course we quietly know that the do something will be move on to the next element. And we, just as a reminder, we're moving from right to left through the array. So we will have something more to refine there, and that's why where the capital B appears, something more for us to uh, elaborate into a piece of code. And at the end of all of that, we of course know that the only way that we've exited the loop is for the guard to not be true. And the guard not being true means that a subscript i is equal to x. And of course, the invariant, if we've taken care with refining the body of this loop, the invariant will also be true. And therefore, we've established the, uh, the post condition of the entire algorithm. So that, uh, that last step there is then inserting the pre and post condition of the body of the loop uh, more explicitly and writing all of this a little bit more vertically so that it typesets nicely. And hopefully, you start to see the, um, the skeleton that's emerging there. Thank you. So now, what can we do with the loop body? And um, this is the part that, um, that always um, has potential to trip people up, but it doesn't really have to. Um, most often, if we've actually taken enough res refinement steps, we've arrived at something where we've got very tiny pieces of code that need to be elaborated. And this is a, a very convenient way, or actually a very critical way of ensuring that we don't fall over any sort of off by one errors or things along those lines. Um, so as a quick reminder, the top line there is what we had as the body of the loop from the previous slide. And it basically says, well, the, we already know that a subscript i is not equal to x. And the reason we know that is we wouldn't be in the body of the loop if, if it were the case, right? Um, the whole reason that we're inside the body of the loop is that the while condition is true and that is the while condition. We also know that the invariant must be true because we're playing by the rules. So at the bottom of each iteration, the invariant is true before the very first iteration, the invariant is true. And as a result, at the top of the, uh, the body of the loop, the invariant must be true. And as part of the, uh, the, the rules, we also ensure that the invariant is true at the bottom of the loop. Uh, so that's reasonably straightforward. And now we would like to uh, then throw in that little bit of detail regarding the, uh, the variant. 
and we can actually add that as one of the uh, the conjuncts in the uh, the post condition. And the uh, the conjunct there is is basically stating that um, the variable i will have advanced from its previous value. And here you've already noticed, I think, also in the introduction that we're taking a little bit of a shortcut, a notational shortcut here, because we're doing this in LaTeX. But um, i subscript zero is simply the original value of i. And uh, what we're attempting to say here is that i at the bottom of the loop will have moved one step closer to, uh, to zero, or our variant will have counted down, monotonically decreasing uh, compared to its previous value at the beginning of that particular iteration. Um, furthermore, if we uh, apply a little bit of intuition here, and um, you know, we certainly don't mean to imply that just because there's some formalism in this, that there, there shouldn't be intuition. I think intuition is actually a very key factor in developing these algorithms. Um, the first thing that you already know is that we need to decrement i. So our decrement uh, operator will be taking us in uh, the array a from right to left, which was the chosen direction. And if we then do a, a rather messy looking substitution and we, we work out the details in pen and paper, or actually we use an automated tool to work out the details, we then see that the decrement operator is actually what's desired there. And furthermore, it's a valid transformation because it, uh, according to the, the rules that were previously introduced, uh, comes out with uh, an appropriate weakest precondition. So had we attempted there to plug in an increment operator, we would immediately have seen that we would be falling flat on our faces and uh, it wouldn't give us the desired uh, result. So Tobias, thank you. We can then as the final version of this, just very quickly walk you through this because I think uh, Tobias is going to give you a very welcome change of gears by showing you something real. Uh, so let me just very quickly talk you through it. This is nicely typeset vertically, which is always, uh, I think, more appealing to people uh, code wise. Um, but at the top and at the very bottom, we've got the pre and post conditions. Those haven't changed. So at the very top, it simply says that X does appear within the array A, somewhere from uh, zero to A dot len, not inclusive of A dot len. Um, and at the very bottom, we know that the invariant will be true. And additionally, that we will have exited the loop. Um, and uh, um, the fact that we've exited the loop means that the guard is not true, which means that A subscript I is equal to X. And that's of course the real thing that we're looking for. And then the rest of the code is this interspersal of initially establishing a correct value for i. We always like to mention the invariant because this is uh, one of the key factors in developing correct loops. And then of course we have the loop itself and just for, uh, for typesetting reasons, the, uh, the invariant is not uh, repeated in there inside the body of the loop or um, at the top of the body or at the bottom of the body of the loop. But um, that's something that you could of course do for, um, for, for completeness. And then lastly, the variant is not explicitly mentioned here, but we've covered that in the last few slides. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you, Tobias, and um, then I'll come back to you in just a moment. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. So I will oh. yep. now start with the um, yeah, hands-on tutorial in WebCorg. So um, the link should be here and also like um, I pres um, added in the select channel um, a small zip file where you have also the link to the file and some um, just some starting files. So I will just show you um, in the web editor. So it should look something like this here. And if you are now having the zip file, you can upload the first example with import graph. And then you're using the linear search start. Yeah, you know, also post it. Uh, link in the chat and yeah that's like the editor here in our web interface so you have all of these boxes it should be one hot triple and you can refine them simply by using this and add new statements when you're clicking on the left hand side onto them then you can drag and drop them so here um, on the left hand side are also prepared like the the variables we are using so we have this array a we have an element X that we want to search and we have an uh, integer I. And we have some global conditions. So conditions that are added to every pre and post condition to make the specification a little bit shorter. So we are saying, okay, the array should be not null. The array length is bigger than zero. And our variable I, that's the loop variable um, is, is inside the bounds of zero and the length of the array. 
Okay, so maybe for you, please, um, the first step is like um, upload the graph and the second step is upload the helper file. So in the helper file, the predicates are specified that you can use, for example, here, it's a PS predicate that you can use in the specification and also for the other examples. Um, any question for that setting up the first example? If not, I will um, quickly, or I will slowly start doing the example in my own. In my own. So you can you know, just follow me, do it by yourself, or maybe, yeah, peek what I am doing when you are stuck somewhere. Um, oh, maybe a, a more important point. So we also do it a little bit more challenging here. So in the example of Bruce, we had like in the precondition that the element appears in the array. So here we have no, a PS predicate in the precondition. So we say we have any array that is bigger than zero and our post condition says, okay, if we have an element I bigger than zero, we found the element and the element should be in the array A should be X. And if we don't find it, find it uh, we say nothing about it. So we could say in the post condition that it's for example, minus one or another value. But if we find it, it should be somewhere inside yeah, the boundaries of the array. That's nearly the same algorithm. I think we only need one or two twists to do it. Tobias, maybe you can explain what you just did. You took mm -hmm. you took a repetition statement and and dragged it yep. to the construction so, pane, and then you connected it, and that's essentially uh, the the refinement, right? Yep, that's one of the refinement steps. So first, we have like as an example a composition statement that is added here and refined by using these small points here and drag and drop it, and then you can use enter here your intermediate statement. And if you then want to refine this first or the second statement, you add another statement from the palette, drag and drop it here. For example, first you're using an assignment statement, specifying what should be assigned. And in the second one, I've added a repetition statement. To, so to do the loop here, as an example, we want to start at the end of the array and know near the repetition, we want to loop through the array using an invariant, a guard, and a variant that need to be filled here. And afterwards you can refine the, the loop body, the loop statement with another statement. So maybe in the repetition, they are the most important points. So you have the same invariant. So you're looking, um, you know, the, the element X don't appears like in the boundaries of I plus one and the length of the array, but in the guard, you have a little bit a difference. So when you don't know that the element is in there, you also have to check that you're still inside of the array. So you're saying, okay, I must um, be bigger or equal to zero. 
and the other part is the same that um, in the array A um, at the position I, the element is not equal to X. As variant, we are using I plus one that we um, decreasing to zero at the end. So if we go outside of the bounds in the last iteration, this could be the case that we have I is minus one, so plus one, and we are getting to our stop condition of zero. And the loop body is the same as before. We are just decreasing I. And now the um, algorithm is completely refined. And when we um, want to ask like, okay, if we built it correctly, we can right click and verify. And now in the background, there's a um, yeah, program solver called key and it tries to verify all of these statements. So for all refinement, we, for example, check here that after the precondition true and executing this statement, the post condition should hold. That's a, a verification here. The same as for the statement here and for the repetition, we also show a little bit more. For example, that the invariant is in the, at the beginning of the um, at the beginning true and also after the last iteration. And additionally, that the repetition statement with this um, yeah, body should uh, terminate. And so all of these proofs are sent to Key, and Key says um, all of them are okay. So we see all the screen borders here. So we created our first example. Cool. Yep. And of course, now as a homework ex assignment, you can actually try to, to build the same, the same program, but reverse the, the array, not from, from, from right to left, but from left to right. To be as we haven't rehearsed that yet. So uh, we haven't yep. rehearsed that. So I'm not sure you want to do that now, but I mean, if um, that that would be something you could you could play with and and see if you make that also work with uh, webcork and also um, yeah if you haven't found that example or do it on your own um, in the import graphs there should be the linear search solution so exactly that implementation that you can check on your own. Okay. Good, thank you. So I don't see questions in Slack and I also don't see questions in chat. Um, I propose, I mean, we are now sort of uh, 75 minutes in. I think um, some of you might need a refill of coffee and some of you are still playing with web corks. So I propose that we make a, um, a 10 minute break now and then we meet back at, at 25 uh, past the hour. So that's uh, 4.25 at least the time zone where I am in. Um, and then uh, we will do another example, uh, Bruce and Tobias together, and then we will show you some more advanced examples um, in, in the next block of the tutorial. So thank you for now, and we meet again in uh, 10 minutes. See you in a moment. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully people actually start coming up with questions that they shoot into, uh, into the channel.
Okay. Welcome back from the break. I see we lost a few, uh, but we will continue with, with more examples and I give back to you. Yeah, thanks very much. In fact, hopefully the people uh, that we lost are, are only in search of more coffee uh, as appropriate. Um, so nonetheless, fortunately, of course, there's a recording and people will hopefully watch that, uh, that after the fact. Um, so let's dive in with the next example, which is the, uh, the maximum element example. Um, it's also a relatively straightforward one that I think many of you could, uh, could code very, very quickly, but it's still instructive to have a look at what the pre and post conditions look like, the refinement of the, the loop and actually proving that this algorithm will terminate. So thanks for, uh, for projecting that, Tobias. Um, sorry, you can move on to the next one. Thanks. So um, in a nutshell, we're again dealing with an array A and we assume that it's some sort of uh, ordinal um, um, value that we can actually compare their elements. We don't really worry about the typing of these elements for the purpose of, of the, uh, the tutorial. Um, but of course it does become important when you're uh, folding this out into real code. So let's just assume we've got an array of integers uh, A for example. And we're looking for an index of the largest element uh, of array A. And I say an index, so that's an important um, uh, word right there because it, it indicates that there may be multiple such elements that are equally large and we don't particularly care which of them we get, okay? So that allows us the freedom then to either look at this as something where we pr uh, proceed from left to right through the array or from right to left through the array and those will give us equally valid, valid algorithms for this particular specification. So there are a few assumptions that we make, um, or we can assume these assumptions were given to us as part of the precondition. And one of the assumptions is of course that the array A contains at least one element. So that will make our lives a little bit easier. And the other one is of course, it may, as I said, contain many elements that correspond to that largest value. And we don't particularly care about finding the first one, the leftmost one, the rightmost one, or anything along those lines. Thanks, Tobias. So if we then uh, switch to writing this down a little bit more formally, the, the precondition is, is extremely easy to write down. We simply assume that the length of the array um, is greater than zero. So that's uh, very easy. For the post condition, again, we would like to have uh, some sort of predicate uh, that allows us to, to express what's going on. The main reason we introduce these kinds of things is to remove some of the tedium of writing out these quantifications in detail. And in this particular case, we'd like our, our precondition to say that the max has been found and it's I in this particular case, and it falls in, uh, within the array A from one particular uh, uh, index to another particular index. So that uh, says something about what I is and how it's computed relative to some sub portion of the array uh, A. And if we look at this particular uh, way that it's written down for the post condition, we'd like I to of course be one of the maximal elements of the entire array A. So um, we'd like to then say that for all of the possible other indices J from zero all the way up to the end of the array, uh, A subscript I is at least um, as big as all of those other um, elements that are indexed by J. And then additionally, we say something about, uh, in that very last conjunct, we actually say something about the value of I, and that is just that it hasn't run off the end of the array, that it's still a valid index. So I think those things are fairly straightforward. And what we'll see on the next slide is a visual depiction of that, which will further shed light. So now we can get down to choosing an invariant. In this particular case, we are gonna proceed from left to right through the array. So we're gonna make our lives uh, perhaps a, a little bit standard in that sense, shall we say. And we're going to use our, our index variable J to proceed from left to right. And we're gonna use I to then keep track of the maximal element that we've actually found so far. So pictorially there we can see index I is that max element up until that point. And in particular, it's the max element from uh, index zero all the way up to, but not including J. And that not including part is very important. We actually come back to that a little bit later. We could have done it so that it is inclusive, but we would have given ourselves a, a number of plus one um, uh, terms in the, uh, in the solution. So this turns out to be a little bit easier as well. Uh, we do, by the way, also see students uh, then making similar um, you know, uh, shortcuts or, or assumptions and making their own lives easier when developing things like binary search 
and, and of course, various sorting algorithms. So there we see um, that I is the max element in that portion of the array strictly to the left of J. So in other words, not including J. And furthermore, from J all the way to the end of the array, we simply know nothing about what's going on there. So an, an even bigger element may actually occur there. We simply don't know that. So we just like to say that's the subarray to be tested or that's still part of the array that we're gonna have a look at a little bit later on. So our invariant is then conveniently, as you've already guessed, that we actually have I set to the current max for that portion that we've inspected. And um, we'd also like to note what our variant is. And there's a, a very tiny typo there that you may have seen already, but the, oh, sorry, Tobias. Ah, you caught it. Very good. Thanks, Tobias. Tobias is uh, considerably faster than me on these things. So as, uh, as he correctly said, um, the variant there is the distance from J until the end of the array. So uh, we could have thought about using I. The problem there is that um, I would be typically advancing from left to right, but not monotonically from left to right. So we wouldn't have a decreasing, a monotonically decreasing function. And that's important because in each iteration of the loop, uh, we'd like to be able to show that there is progress that's happening, that kind of monotonic progress. And uh, so the variant must decrease with each iteration. And that of course, given we're dealing with finite data structures, is one of the key factors in showing correctness um, in terms of termination. Of course, if we have infinite data structures, we're dealing with a um, you know, whole other uh, ball of wax, which we don't discuss uh, here right now. So our variant is then the distance from J to the end of the array. And um, the, the last two sentences note what I already said that the, the invariant is saying something about that portion that we've already seen. Uh, it isn't necessarily saying anything useful about the portion that we haven't seen yet. In other words, there could be something further to the right. And in particular, the jth element there, the one um, at, at which our current J index is, that element is something also about which we're not saying anything in the invariant. So that's where that uh, up to but not including part comes in. Thanks, Tobias. So now we can actually make a, a couple of steps in refinement. Uh, the notation is more or less the same as the previous version that you saw with the linear search. Uh, there are a couple more shortcuts in terms of leaving things out, which uh, I don't think you'll find too disturbing. And in the next example, we have actually even some more things that are left out, which make life uh, a little bit easier as well. So the first steps that we can make are then starting with the original specification. So we have our precondition that it's a non-empty array. There's at least one element there. And our post condition, of course, is that um, by the end of this algorithm, by the end of the execution of statement S, we've then been able to compute I in such a way that I is um, a maximal element, sorry, the index of a maximal element from zero up to, but not including A dot lin. In other words, the entire array, which is our desired post condition. And uh, as we did previously, we know that we're going to need a loop. And one of the best things that you can do then is, is rather quickly introduce your invariant and also introduce a little piece of code followed by what's going to be the body of the loop. And that little piece of code again here is called init uh, simply because we wish it to, uh, to set the variables up correctly for us so that it establishes the invariant, which is one of the crucial things, of course, before the loop starts. So what you'll notice is compared to the previous presentation, uh, the previous algorithm at least, here we don't actually explicitly mention the frame. Uh, so, so the frame would have been um, some variables followed by colon followed by init or S2 in this particular case. And the frame is then um, in a sense a, 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 an agreement about which variables will be changed in that piece of code. And it's useful for uh, carving out a little bit of the specification and then handing it to one person to refine. Um, where someone else is refining a separate part of the specification. In this case, we really know that we shouldn't be messing with uh, the array A, um, and we do actually want to change I and J as we proceed through this algorithm. So the next step that we can make is then to, as I say, establish the invariant, and that's done rather easily by observing that, well, we'd like to start at the left end of the array, but we'd like to start with I being set to something uh, sensible, and if we choose I to be uh, zero, so in other words, pointing to the first element of the array, which we know must exist because it's a non-empty array, then um, we immediately have the, the fact that I is the, uh, the largest element or a largest element of that part of the array that's been observed so far. 
And observed so far means that we can actually set J equal to one so that we can actually move already from the second element onwards. So we've already saved ourselves a, a tiny piece of work. We haven't had to introduce anything really weird like a, a sentinel value. Uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of temptation, I think, when people code this up initially to start J at the left end of the array and then use uh, for the value I, use something like uh, minus max int um, or, or minus infinity or something along those lines. So we've been able to get out of having to do that as well. Um, so moving on, we can then actually also make our refinement of S2, which is the part that we know is going to be the, the loop. We also happen to know already what the invariant is. We know that from the previous slide uh, pictorially, um, that I is, is corresponding to that, um, the max element of the part of the array that's already been examined. And we also know that we would like to not run off the end of the array. So you're going to have to take my assurance right now when I say that one of the ways of doing that is to say that we want to continue doing something as long as j is not equal to a dot len. And as soon as we have actually have uh, j equal to a dot len, we have run off the end of the array. And that's a good time for us to stop, uh, terminate the loop, and, um, and hope everything else is correct. And it turns out if you then take that as, uh, as our guard, the negation of the guard, in other words, when have we terminated the loop? Well, we've terminated the loop when j is equal to a dot len. That combined with the invariant allows us to then show that the post condition will be satisfied. Um, so in other words, we've, we've taken j all the way to the end of the array and we know that i is valid for all of those j's and uh, we've accomplished what we needed to accomplish. So the very last line there is the beginning of fleshing out that loop. Thanks, Tobias. So to fill in the details of this loop, the very top line that you see there is, uh, is basically a copy of the, the, the loop line from the previous slide. And we can now start to write it a little bit more vertically because it's gonna be interesting to fill in the details of this loop. Um, we haven't copied the, the uh, specifics of the, the um, variant and the invariant and naming them at least as invariant and variant up we get part way down here. But the first thing that we can do is push the, um, the invariant in front of B, which is the body of the loop. So that's why we chose the letter B. And that's then the precondition for B. And there's another conjunct for that precondition and that is the guard. So J not equal to A dot len. And we know that that must be true. Otherwise we wouldn't be executing the body of the loop. And furthermore, then the post condition of B is again the invariant, we'd like that to be true. And furthermore, we would like our variant to have monotonically decreased from value V subscript zero, which is what it was at the, at the beginning of the, uh, the, the loop iteration. So we'd like to be making monotonic progress and be able to prove that. Um, so now we can actually then factor in our specific invariant, sorry, our specific variant. And once we factor that in, and, um, and elaborate on the details, which is what you see to the, uh, to the very right end of the body of the middle algorithm there, that part of the, um, uh, the post condition for B2 uh, is then saying that we've made progress. And we already know that in order to make progress, we would like B2 to, to somehow advance J a little bit further within the loop. And um, so we can derive the precondition for B2, which is then obviously what fits in as the post condition for B1. And in our last version of the algorithm on this particular slide, we've got our increment operator for J, but we don't yet know what we actually need in the code just before that. And that becomes important because if we're going to increment J at the very end, we need to make sure that we've actually taken a look at that element A subscript J. And that's important because our invariant specifically said that I is a, a maximal element or an index of a maximal element up to, but not including J. And of course, if we increment J, we'd like to now specifically take into account A subscript J, which is the name of the game for our uh, refinement for B1. Thank you, Tobias. So um, refining B1, um, armed with what we already know we'd like to accomplish, we'd like to finish B1 saying that I is a maximal element for the stretch from zero up to, but not including J plus one. In other words, up to, but including J. That's what we'd like to accomplish with B1. Um, going into B1, we also know that the, the loop guard is true. So in other words, we haven't run off the end of the array. So any use of J will be a valid use of J, which is very important from a security and, and correctness perspective, uh, no segmentation faults and so on. Furthermore, we also know that before B1, 
we have the invariant. And the invariant said, of course, that i is a maximal element from zero up to, but not including j. So that allows us to now take into account a subscript j. And, um, and then we will actually have that post condition for b1 be valid. And the way we take into account uh, a subscript j is to simply ask ourselves, well, um, is a subscript j, is a sub j a new maximal element? In other words, is it bigger than a sub i? or is it not necessarily bigger? So it may be uh, the same or smaller. And that gives us two cases and that allows us to then uh, fill in one of these if statements. And in the first branch of the if statement, we have the case where we actually do have a new max element. And if we have that new max element, we know that we're going to have to keep track of it by updating i. If we don't have a new max element, if it's simply a tiebreaker or it's actually a smaller element, we don't necessarily need to do anything we certainly don't need to update i unless we specifically want to keep track of the rightmost um, uh, max element. Um, but that wasn't within the specification of the algorithm. So there we will choose to do nothing. And um, with these two uh, possibilities, we've then got within the sub branches of that uh, first larger algorithm involved in the if statement uh, that you have on the slide there. In, the, in each of those two possibilities, we actually have the guards. In other words, what is the test of that if statement? If a uh, sub j is greater than a sub i, now we can actually put that guard also within the precondition of our statement S1, because the only way that execution would arrive at that point is for that guard to be true. And of course, we have still the, um, the various other goodies that we had already as the precondition of the, the loop body B1 or part of the loop body B1. And we have the, the post condition. And in both branches of that if statement, the post condition is the same. And almost all of the, uh, the precondition of S1 and S2 are the same. They only differ in terms of what is true depending on the particular branch. So once we fill in the details for that, the relatively obvious transformation in the first branch is that we want to assign J to be I because we have a new max element. And in the second case, we simply have a skip statement or a not or uh, whatever you might call it in other languages. Uh, which does nothing. Now, um, this was covered already in the in the first hour, but it's important to to note that that kind of seeming inefficiency is then filled out in this kind of pseudocode. And the reason is for us to have two valid branches of execution. Um, obviously, when you transliterate this into uh, Java, C++, C, assembly language, and so on, you typically wouldn't actually put in that skip statement. Uh, and even if you did, the compiler would typically remove it anyway. Um, but nonetheless, it's important here for us to actually show the correctness of what's going on and show that we've covered all of the possibilities. And explicitly covering all of the possibilities is one of the key factors within the guarded command language. Uh, a very common mistake we see is that not covering all of the possibilities then leads to um, a program that's actually incorrect. So had we left that out there, it's not a, a silent ignore in the case of, of the guarded command language. It actually is um, in, incorrect by the semantics of, uh, of the extra guarded command language. Thanks, Tobias. So now we can round off that particular algorithm with an extremely simple looking final version. This is completely unannotated, um, of course, stripped of all of the precondition, postcondition, uh, loop invariant and, uh, and variant material. But nonetheless, you can see there an, an algorithm which is painfully simple. Um, it's a tiny bit more efficient than I think many people would typically have written. Certainly many students would typically have written, uh, assuming we of course ignore the skip statement. And uh, as we of course uh, all know amongst professionals, you would typically then make use of, of some kind of post increment operator to make that uh, a little bit more efficient if the compiler didn't already do that for you. So at that note, I'm going to um, hand it, I think, back to Tobias, and then uh, it'll come back to me again for another example. Thanks. So I know we'll take over again. So we are back in uh, WebCorg. And now, um, if you want to do the second example, we sometimes have problem with the safe cookies in there. So to um, yeah, to don't run into any problems, please open another um, another incognito window and start the same process for the second algorithm. So import the graph, the um, max element start, and then in the second step, upload the helper file. So here we have the specification as before, we are saying, okay, we have some array and here in the global condition, conditions, we say, okay, the array 
should be um, of length bigger than zero. And in the post condition, we have this maximum here called max E that says, okay, the maximum in th of the array A should be element uh, at the position I in the boundaries of zero to the length of the array. So when we now start creating the algorithm, we do the same as before. We're using a composition statement to split the problem into two parts and writing an intermediate condition. So the intermediate condition is our um, invariant. So, okay, we are saying now, okay, the maximum should be between, or uh, that we are looking at currently is between zero and J, J not included, and should be at position I. To fulfill that, our first statement here is that we are saying E is equal zero and J is equal one. Then we have uh, yeah, the repetition statement added here with an invariant that is uh, yeah, our invariant as before. The guard, as long as we are not at the end of the array. And our variant. So now when we are inside of the array, we have an, again two parts that we want to do. So we first, first want to check the current element at position J, J and then we want to increment J. So invariant is, you know, our intermediate condition is nearly as invariant, but we are one step further. And we still know that J is smaller than the length of the array. So in uh, in the example um, on the slides, we have omitted this, but that's when we now want to verify it, it's important that we still know, okay, our element J is smaller than the length of the array that we, when we increment J, we don't get out of bounds. So yeah, we have to be explicit that key can verify um, yeah, the whole algorithm. Now we have a selection statement with two guards. One guard is saying that the element J that we are currently looking at is bigger than I, and the other one is the opposite. So the last part here, when we have found a bigger element, we are saying, okay, now our i is equal to j. In the other case, we are doing nothing, just writing a semicolon. And here in the last part, we have to increment j. Okay. So that should be all. And then we now ask here again, get a small problem. So as I said, okay, um, if you're running in the same problem, you can just um, export the graph, opening um, a new web corp with a new um, incognito window and uh, importing the graph again. So I will quickly do that. Just importing the solution, which should be the same. Uploading the helper file. And asking key now. So it maybe takes some time. 
Because there are a lot of verification processes for every every statement, and also that the selection is true, so that the um, repetition is true in the beginning and the end, the invariant, that the repetition terminates. As you can see, the whole algorithm is green. Yep. Cool. Thank you. I don't see any questions, Tobias, but. But that the, the problem that you had to work around is a sort of a session cookie thing problem. Yeah. Sometimes the session cookie gets yeah, too big and then you have to do it again. So just um, okay. export the graph, do another, um, yeah, another window with um, new cookies, uploading the graph again and asking key. Okay. I don't I don't see any questions so far so I I propose that we move on with the with the more advanced examples that that maybe are also more interesting for the security crowd. Fair enough. That sounds good. Um, and I should for anyone listening just note that we'll have another uh, brief break at the end of this particular example. So I think that would be a, a good juncture for uh, people to uh, fetch still more coffee and so on. So the third example is related to pattern matching. This is um, a string pattern matching, string pattern recognition, it's also called. Um, and it's the kind of uh, thing that in more elaborate forms underpins regular expressions and of course, uh, lots of text validation and so on. Thanks, Tobias. So um, to give you a very quick overview of what the problem is, I mean, this diagram, uh, actually a couple of diagrams, uh, capture the entire scene. So I'd like to just briefly talk you through it. Um, in a nutshell, we have an array A. It's an array of characters or a string is, is a more appropriate way to think of it, especially in, in uh, most languages. And we have a pattern P, which is also a string. Typically P is shorter than A for the simple reason that we're looking for all occurrences of P appearing within uh, string A. So, um, you know, of course, if, if P was, was larger, um, or the same length as, as A, we would have a very, very simple problem. So typically it's, it's much, much uh, shorter. Uh, in this particular instance, we prefer not to pre-process A. Uh, there are lots and lots of algorithms which construct an index of A, but those are, are much larger and more difficult to explain in terms of CDC. Uh, some of those algorithms have been found to be incorrect, of course. Um, and that also indicates a, a good motivation for developing these kinds of things within CDC. So this kind of algorithm does find its way into various libraries, which um, at the very beginning of, um, of this tutorial was one of the factors that was explained as being a good motivation for using CDC for this kind of fundamental or infrastructural software that finds its way in there. Um, in our particular um, version, we're going to use another array A, uh, sorry, another array M, and that array M is simply used to capture all of the matches. So M stands for matches. And we'll flag a match at position I with a one as an entry within the, the M array at position I as well. And for a mismatch, we'll actually flag it as being minus one. And of course, we could have made this a bit vector. So it could have been ones and zeros. Um, one and minus one uh, was chosen uh, somewhat specifically to give us three values. So in other words, one would be a, a matched value, minus would, one would be there is no match, and zero would of course be that there is nothing yet known about that particular position. And having those three values, certainly in the pseudocode version of this allows us to reason a little bit more cleanly about what's going on within the algorithm. Whereas just using the bit vectors as you would do in a real life implementation um, as the next trans, uh, translation from the pseudocode to a real implementation in C, C++, Java, and so on, um, you would actually uh, squash out that one value and just make it uh, a bit vector. So in this particular case, if we take a look at the two different match attempts, there are two copies of P that are aligned there against uh, A in the top part of the diagram. And the first copy of P, I should say the leftmost copy of P is aligned with another red portion of A, and that's to indicate that there is a successful match. So in other words, character for character, they match exactly. So we don't do those elaborate things related to, uh, to um, partial matching or matching with errors or, or things along those lines. This is a nice, simple sounding problem at least. And um, in the other case uh, where P is aligned with a gray portion of array A, 
the idea there is to signify that at that particular location, so that's index J, at that particular location, we actually do not have a successful match. Uh, in this particular diagram, we can't really see which uh, uh, character of P mismatched with the corresponding character within A, but nonetheless, there was a mismatch and that allows us to say, well, uh, we color that gray, but more importantly, in terms of registering the matches, that means in our array M, we have uh, the entry of minus one as well. So um, the last thing to note, and uh, if you find some of our material online related to this, um, we do um, make mention of the fact that the array M does need to have a certain uh, length, okay? And that length, well, the easiest thing would be to, of course, make it just as long as array A. Um, there's a slightly more complicated looking expression there, and that is the length of A minus the length of P plus one. And the reason is in the last few uh, characters of the array A, it doesn't make sense to align P there and attempt to match for the simple reason that the last characters of P will actually be off the, uh, the end of array A. And um, not only is that wasteful, that of course will also uh, invite the issue of out of bounds access of the string or a buffer overrun or a segmentation fault or something along those lines. So for all of those reasons, um, we're going to be a little bit more precise in, um, in the next few minutes, just about the, uh, those bounds. And that's where that more complicated expression comes in, the one that you see at the bottom of the screen. Thanks, Tobias. So how can we then proceed with uh, specifying this? Well, we've already got all of the kit that we need for, uh, uh, for writing down our pre and post condition. Uh, the precondition is simply that we have an array M of the appropriate size. Um, you might have already guessed that there are many other possible things that we could actually write in uh, preconditions. Sometimes people write things in there related to the specific types of uh, variables, where some uh, programming languages, of course, support um, range types. Uh, and in that case, you would simply declare it and it wouldn't necessarily be part of the pre, uh, precondition. Nonetheless, um, here we've said something just specifically about the size of the array uh, M with respect to the uh, array A. And of course, there would have been other things to write uh, with respect to um, the types and the, the size of the array P. The other thing is um, at the top part of um, just above the pre and post condition, the part that's in blue is, um, uh, is the beginning of our specification. And this notation is a little bit different from the one that you've seen before. We've until now mostly seen the Hoare triples uh, named after Tony Hoare. So the Hoare triples have a precondition followed by S followed by a post condition. And the pre and post condition are both within the curly braces. Um, and uh, I think many people consider those somewhat standard. This notation is thanks to Carol Morgan. And uh, as we also saw at the beginning, um, he's the author of one of the books also to be found online, a very good book where um, he has a slightly more elaborate calculus for, for developing these algorithms. But perhaps um, just as interestingly, he's got another notation, which in some ways is a little bit more compact. And that notation then groups the pre and post within square brackets next to each other and puts the, um, uh, the frame in front of that. So which are, are the uh, variables that may be changed as we refine something to uh, achieve that post condition. Now back to our post condition that we see on screen there. This particular post condition um, has a nice quantification in it. And the quantification, um, uh, as we know, we don't have a specific bound on the array A. So we actually uh, almost always need a quantification to actually say anything interesting about that array computationally, unless we know it has a specific size. And a quantification also almost always hints that we're going to need a loop of some kind. So in this particular case, the quantification says that for all valid indexes, K, uh, at which we could actually even bother to make a match attempt, and those valid indexes go from zero all the way up to um, A dot n minus P dot n plus one, uh, not inclusive. So don't forget it has that, uh, that round uh, parenthesis at the end there. That indicates it's not inclusive on the right side, but for all valid indexes where we might want to actually make a match attempt, in the case that there is a valid match, so that's the first uh, disjunct, uh, the second last line, in other words, in the case there is a valid match, so P is equal to that stretch of letters starting at K, then M sub K is equal to one. And of course, if there isn't a valid match, in other words, P is not equal to that stretch of letters starting at K, then M sub K is equal to minus one. So that simply says that uh, for our post condition, we would like to over all of the valid indexes 
have correctly filled in the one and the minus one according to whether or not there's uh, there's a match. Thanks, Tobias. Um, so now we can actually choose a variant, sorry, a, an invariant and a variant. Um, and um, we've already hinted at what the possible invariants are. And uh, I think uh, everyone won't be necessarily very surprised if we say that as we proceed globally through the array A from left to uh, right, we might use uh, an, an index I, for example, to proceed from left to right. As we proceed, there will be a portion of the array A of the string that we've actually checked so far for valid matches. And as we proceed, that corresponding portion within M will actually have been filled in correctly. And then there'll be a, a perhaps significant chunk of the, uh, the string A to the right of I, starting with I, that has not yet been checked. And in other words, because it hasn't yet been checked, we, uh, we actually haven't necessarily filled in anything within M. And so we're not even going to make a statement about what the values would be within the array uh, M. Now we can also very clearly in this, um, in this diagram see that the, um, that the array M is somewhat shorter than the array A and the, uh, the red dashed line across the right end of the string A indicates that that's the part in which we needn't bother actually doing a match. Um, I call that in, uh, in stringology, uh, the dead zone. So it's a, it's a part where it doesn't even make sense to, uh, to attempt something. And for that reason, we aren't going to need entries within M uh, because there's no possible way that a match starts there. So we, we now have these two different arrays. We can say something sensible as per the invariant as to um, which uh, parts we've seen so far and the corresponding way that M has been filled in. And then those parts that we haven't seen so far are not even mentioned within the invariant. Thanks, Tobias. Okay, so um, now we can actually build up the parts of our algorithm, uh, knowing actually that we need a loop. It turns out actually that we need two loops. In the particular version that I'll show you right now, this is a, a, what could be called a brute force or a naive uh, string pattern matching algorithm. Uh, for those of you that know something about that field, you'll probably know that there are literally dozens of different algorithms, many of which are, are obviously much more efficient than uh, a brute force algorithm. Nonetheless, this is easier to cover. And um, it would typically consist of two nested loops, which we will not do today, um, but I'll, I'll be able to point out to you precisely where the loops would emerge as well. So now we start out um, our, our derivation or our attempt to arrive at an algorithm by knowing that we need to manipulate M in some way. And in fact, we also need to manipulate I in some way. So from the first line to the second line, um, that's actually what we're accomplishing there, just mentioning that I is part of the frame as well. Um, and that will be used as our index variable within string A, but also our index variable, corresponding index variable within M. And our precondition and postcondition are the ones that we had discussed before. The precondition is not written out um, in any detail here because that's simply related to the respective sizes of M with respect to the size of A, that there is enough of, uh, of the M array. And the, um, the postcondition is of course the fact that the invariant should be true but also that I should have actually reached the end of the array. And those two things combined allow us to then know that we've accomplished the, um, the post condition. So we know that, um, that we were on the right track with the invariant, at least in terms of achieving the post condition when we can actually write it out like that. And now we can again, just like in the previous algorithms where we split our, our uh, statement into two subparts and in its subpart followed by something else. Um, and the init part then sets up the, um, the loop invariant, in other words, establishes the values of some of the, um, the variables so that we actually know that the loop invariant is true even before we start the first iteration. So that's very important, must always be the case. Uh, in order to do that, we again split things up into two pieces. And the first piece uh, assumes the precondition and simply has to establish the invariant. And the next piece, of course, assumes that the invariant has been established and then must also establish the invariant along with the fact that I has now run off the right end of the string. And that together means that we've accomplished the entire um, uh, algorithmic um, post condition. So the way that the, the initialization gets refined, this one is super simple. We're simply going from left to the right through the array. So a, a good guess, and we could then actually go and prove it, but a good guess is simply to set I equal to zero, uh, which is what's done on the second last line there. And I equals to zero um, without filling in the details does indeed establish the invariant. In other words, 
everything to the left of that, which is the empty array, has been considered already and M has been appropriately filled in, which is also true because it's empty. And then we can now move on to the body of the, uh, the, the uh, loop, sorry, not the body of the loop, the rest of the algorithm, which is the loop, and of course its corresponding body. <clears throat> Thank you, Tobias. So now to develop the loop, um, the top part here is simply um, the last line from the previous uh, slide. So we're, we're not necessarily delving again into initializing the variable. That's uh, is something that we'll collect at the very end again. But let's focus now on what will become the, um, the uh, loop itself. And the way to do that is to take a look at the various uh, conjuncts that we have um, on the very first line there in the second part of the post condition. And one of the things that we have is, of course, that at the end of this, we need to have, have run i all the way to the end of the array. And we also know that that pattern that we need for loops, where we've got the invariant, and then at the, as the post condition, we've got the invariant along with something else, which we can then potentially turn into our guard by negating it. We're in exactly the same situation here, where we can pluck that conjunct out of the uh, uh, that post condition and negate it. In other words, we change it from i being uh, greater than or equal to the max of all of those things. We change that to being i less than the max of all of those things. And we have our guard ready made for us. And intuitively, this actually is, is in correspondence with, with what we wanted to accomplish. We already know that as we're moving from uh, one side of the algorithm to the uh, one side of the string to the other, uh, using our variable i, we don't want to run off the end. And in fact, even better, we don't even want to run into that useless part at the right end of string A, uh, the so-called dead zone, because we know that that's going to be redundant work. But not only that, we also know that if we were to align P up against A at that portion of the, uh, the string, we have a potential to overrun the end of, of A. So it's very important that we actually have this as our guard. For those of you that are coders, you know, looking at a guard that looks like that, if you were to then code this in um, as, you, as your while loop within uh, C or C++ or any other language, you may immediately um, have a moment of panic about efficiency. Uh, but of course, this is exactly the kind of thing that compilers are good at. Uh, A.len, P.len, and one are all constants. And the max of those against zero um, is also a constant. So there's a, a significant amount of, of constant folding that's possible here. And of course, uh, constant hoisting, because these are, are not things that will change during iterations of the loop. So um, they would typically be lifted to uh, being pre-computed in the generated assembly code, and there wouldn't be any loss of efficiency, despite the fact that it looks like there's a, a more complicated expression there in the guard. So uh, optimizing uh, too, too early or prematurely would be a mistake in this case. Um, now down to the body of the loop. The body of the loop also looks interesting. So we of course know that the invariant must be true, which is why we've copied the, copied the invariant there again. Um, but we also know that the guard must be true. So we've actually copied the guard there. Um, I've taken a bit of a shortcut by writing the guard a little bit differently. So uh, we're simply saying that we haven't run into that element, the sentinel element at the very end. If you were doing this in, um, in C or C++, or perhaps more C, you would of course also already have null terminated strings. So you would uh, in a sense be guaranteed of that. But if you have a, a proper string length function, that would be even safer. So as our precondition for the body, we have the invariant and the guard, otherwise we wouldn't have actually arrived there. And we need to establish again the invariant and we also need to have advanced our variant function, which means that we typically will have to have, have done something with i. The reason is um, uh, th th that we know that i will be part of this is that we can say that uh, most sensible in this particular case, but also in the max element case that we just considered, the most sensible possible um, invariants are the distance from where you are now until the end of the array. And we know that that should be monotonically decreasing. Um, and it doesn't have to decrease in steps of one. So it could be decreasing in larger steps as occurs in some other algorithms, but it must be monotonically decreasing. And that's something that we could additionally prove here as well. Um, and then we can um, use a, a specific rule, which um, if you take a look for it online, you'll see it's not one that we uh, named. It's one whose name has been floating around in the CDC world for quite a while. But it, it uh, simply says that if you already know that you're going to at the bottom of that body of the loop need an increment, 
In this case, um, I becomes I plus one, incrementing I. Then there's a, a rule that allows us to inject that and do some very small manipulations of the post condition of the statement preceding that. And that allows us to have a new statement, which we uh, will refine a little bit further. Tobias? Okay, so um, now things look a little bit more busy, but we actually are simply dealing with that little part um, of the loop from the previous slide that hasn't been fleshed out in detail yet. And so the specific um, uh, details of the, the post condition uh, are not really needed. We've also dropped um, the variant for, from there. But intuitively, we already know that at the bottom of the loop, we're going to advance i by, by one to move it a little bit further to, towards the end of the array. And before we do that, we would like to consider what it is that appears at i and be able to update our, um, our, our variable or our array m with an appropriate entry at m sub i. And that would allow us to bring us, uh, would allow us to be back in um, conformance with the invariant. So the invariant says something about everything up to, but not including i. And we would like to now um, adjust it appropriately for i as well, and then allow us to move on by incrementing i. So the way to do that is of course, to specifically consider what it is that's at uh, position i within the string a. And for that, we simply make a comparison of P against the string that starts, the substring of A that starts at I. And we, of course, would continue for uh, P.len characters. That doesn't make sense to continue further than that. And we make a comparison there. Either P does appear at position I within A or does not appear. So those are our only two possibilities. And in the first of the two possibilities, we update uh, M sub I with a one. And in the other possibility, we update it with at minus one, indicating that there was no match. And if you uh, look at this just briefly, certainly if you've ever had to program any of the, the deep details of algorithms like this, you'll immediately see that I'm cheating a little bit here by having a comparison of a substring against a, uh, a keyword P. And it's something that actually should be done using some kind of loop or using string compare. Um, or using a couple of assembly language instructions. Some processors, of course, support that directly. So fully recognizing that that should be fleshed out into another loop, um, we uh, leave this as being one of the, the exercises for anyone who's particularly interested in that. And um, we can then take this particular high level solution. And then on the next slide, just show you the, the, the last, um, I believe on the next slide, the last version of this algorithm that puts it all together. So in this version of the algorithm, uh, again, with many of the, uh, the annotated details left out, now we can actually put all of these pieces together. And putting these pieces together means that we initially establish uh, the invariant by setting i equal to zero. And then we'll iterate over values of i until we're um, at the end of the interesting portion of the, uh, the string a. So in other words, we don't overrun into that dead zone part of the, uh, the, um, the string. And then we would typically have this nested loop there, which is the one that was left as an exercise. But this nested loop would itself use a variable um, uh, j, an index j. And we would have that nested loop there again without uh, the details filled in. But that would actually do the character for character comparison against that particular uh, position, the ith position within a uh, against the characters of p. And then depending on the outcome of that would either set of the appropriate uh, entry m sub i to be one or minus one. And then finally, we move on to um, i becomes i plus one and um, onwards towards the end of the array. So at that, um, I believe it's my turn to hand it over to our, um, our practical expert and tool developer. Tobias, thank you. Yep. So we are now implementing that algorithm not in WebCorp, but in Cork itself. So it's a little bit more complicated that we will do it um, in the whole or in the, the Cork development in Eclipse. And yeah, I will just guide you through the code as you cannot yeah, do it hands on. So we have like the same specification and implementation as you've seen on the slide. We're saying like, okay, um, yeah, we have the array A and the array P that we want to compare. And we have the, yeah, the match array M. And in the end, 
it's a post condition. We want to know, okay, all these places K in M that are one when we found the match and that are minus one when we don't found the match. And this matches predicate exactly says that, that in uh, array A and uh, we found um, yeah, array P in the boundaries of K and the length of array P. Yeah, so as you can see, some parts are wet. So there are some missing parts. So in the f uh, beginning, we have like, okay, we set I to zero. Then we have the repetition as long as we are like in the specific shorter part here where we say, okay, as long as we are inside of the length of the array minus uh, P, so, so that we don't look at the last part that's not important anymore because it's not long enough to contain P. And yeah, in that loop, we now have another composition. So we do like the big part and in the end increment I. And that big part has some missing things. So in the big part, there's again um, a loop found here. So we have like a statement J that uh, the, uh, the beginning zero. And now we want to increment J and loop through the array to find, okay, if there's an occurrence of P. So that should be done if we see, okay, um, J should now um, compare the array M with array P. And as long as J is not p.length, we compare always um, the position um, J in array P with the position in array A, that's I plus J. So we just increment in each, uh, oh, so we, for example, start in the beginning, both at zero and then go step by step through the array. And when we found in, um, in a match, we um, increment or set this position in the match array. And if not, we say, okay, it's a minus one, we don't find it. Then we increment I and do the same from J is zero and I is one and go again and again until we found all occurrences. So here, the first part is missing. So if you remember, we want to loop through the array. So we just say, for example, J should be incremented in each step. So when we write that, we can now ask our verification tool if that's correct. That may take some time. No, checking like, okay, can I deduce from this precondition by um, incrementing J to get at the post condition? That's correct here. Now we have to also check that the um, loop terminates. That was a quick one. And yeah, now we have just checked Okay, the part is um, again at the specific um, part in M is P equal or not. And when we know, um, stop this, um, this loop here, we know, okay, J is equal to P dot length is one exit condition or these elements are not equal. And now we can use that in our selection statement afterwards. So here one, one is open. That would be like, okay, what is the case when J is equal P dot length. And the other one is okay, what's the case when they are not equal? So we know when they are equal, we iterate it through both and have seen okay, uh, we have a match because every element, as you can see here, we are equal. So we know, okay, we can set our matching array at position I to be one. And in the other case, we are don't have a match, so we set it to minus one. When we verify this one, we can see that this we found is correct. And the last verification step is here saying, okay, we have all like all specific conditions um, yeah, covered. So we have J is equal to P dot length or the other case, they are not equal. So as you can see now, we have everywhere a green border. Now we have also verify here the variant. And if that's also true, we verified the whole algorithm. Yep, that's in the yeah. editor here. Thank you. Are there any questions? If not, we I don't. Want... I don't I don't see any questions in the in the Slack chat no. and not in the Zoom chat either. I've posted the 
the link to our GitHub repository where you can find more information and more examples and also the download and installation instructions for the, the standalone version of Cook um, if you want to try that as well. Good, I'm looking at, at time. Um, I mean, Bruce promised you, promised you a break and then spend so much time being excited about pattern matching. Um, in the Apologies interest- Apologies indeed. <laughs> no, no, all cool. I mean, um, yeah, shall we, shall we do a quick break or shall we just move on? I mean, I see 16 people and before they run away, I would just say that we move on and maybe we finish five minutes earlier. Okay. Yeah, then I cool. Then um, we'll move on with the next part. Maybe it's getting no more inter uh, interesting for the security part. So we have now seen on all these slides before that we're doing like, okay, correctness by construction and correctness means it's functionally correct. The algorithm we develop, but what are other properties that we can maybe uh, check? So non-functional properties, for example, the performance, the memory consumption, or as we want to show now security. So we want, to show security by construction that each step the algorithm is developed, we um, also ensure some security properties. And in our case, we are doing information flow. So we want to check that the information flow in our program ensures confidentiality and or integrity of the system. So that one is like um, giving a quick example. We have, for example, a client server situation and the client and the server have different security levels. So for example, the server is more, or the data on the server is more confidential than on the clients. And for the confidentiality, we want to ensure that the client should not read the data of the server uncontrolled. So maybe there's some passwords or other things that the client should not read. And we, if we want to ensure that, we ensure confidentiality. In the other case, we can also say, um, the server should not read client data uncontrolled because that can influence integrity of the system. A client can have some malicious software that should not be read or executed by the server. So we have like these two important properties, confidentiality and integrity, and we can ensure that by checking the information flow. So um, when each information in the system has a specific security level, a security label, then we can ensure by checking what is assigned or maybe in other specific cases, um, the information flow and check if it's uh, correct or secure or not. And yeah, usually you would lose, uh, use some postdoc analysis like a type system or other um, analysis strategies to um, ensure that. But here, as we have seen before, we use the correctness by construction approach. So we are doing, um, yeah, we are specifying the problem in case of information flow and do it by construction that we ensure that the software is always, um, yeah, ensures our information flow policies. Yes, so um, what is information flow control exactly? So we have like this non-interference property. It's like the main property we want to ensure. So that means like the data of different security levels should not interfere. So for example, to make it more specific, we have some confidential data as a password and it should not be deducible or assigned to some public output that we have. So you should not print a public password to an, um, yeah, to uh, a private password to a public console. And how can that happen? So we have two different kinds of information flow. We have the direct information flow through assignments, then you just assign the private password to a public variable, or we have, it's more, uh, more interesting one, the indirect information flow. So the indirect information flow could be done um, with loop guards or if conditions. So for example, you can have a loop guard um, if password bigger than five. So if it's a number, then do the following, else do something else. And if you then know which guard or which uh, branch you take, you can deduce some information or the whole information of this password. And that should also um, not, or uh, that can also, um, um, yeah, can also have some security leaks in there. So the we also have to track that. And how we do that, we have like a lattice of security levels and we have an allowed flow in these, in these lattice. So as, um, if we look at the um, lattice on the bottom left, we have, for example, a public level and the top secret level and some levels in between. 
and we allow that the information flows from public to top secret, but not the other way around. So for example, the password could be top secret, secret and it should not be assigned to public variable. Other lattices could be like here unclassified to cosmic top secret, or in the case of um, integrity tainted and untainted. Okay, so how can we check that information um, in order that information flow is correct. So if you have example here, we can, uh, for example, annotate variables with security levels, low and high in our example. So that just a uh, yeah, payment action where we um, validate a credit number and in the end, um, yeah, or, um, put uh, yeah, print this credit number, but it should be uh, masked before. And now if you have a type system, we can check that the written program is correct or not. So if it, um, correct in case of the information flow. And as you can see here, we use a declassify operation for specific cases where we want um, yeah, an information flow from, yeah, from high to low. So in the other direction that it's normally not allowed, but it can be used by the programmer in specific cases. So for example, here we mask a credit card. So a declassify operation should be allowed to print these, um, yeah, this encrypted credit card to the output. When we now want to do it by construction, I want to give a little bit of, yeah, a little bigger example. So we have here, um, yeah, like um, uh, it's similar to a max element algorithm that we found before. So we have it's a little bit in a more security context. So we have an array of bits. So in an auction, and we want to uh, compute the highest bidding. So we have our um, yeah we have our algorithm, algorithm auction here. And first we have an initialization phase where we say, okay, our highest bit is zero and, and we start with a loop variable i also be zero. Then we loop through the, through the array of bits. And in each iteration, we check if the highest bit is smaller or bigger than the bit at uh, position i. And in the end, we want to uh, publish the result using a declassify operation. When we now construct it um, incrementally with our um, by construction approach, we use a again a specification, but the specification here is a little bit different. So we are saying, okay, what variables are we having and what security levels does these specific variables have to track if the information flow is correct or not. So we have our public variable PB, it's uh, short for published bit, and we have the private array of bits, and in the end, we have the same variables here. We also have uh, our loop variable i and the secret highest bit that is also computed in between. And here this public is um, a security context that is or can be handy for tracking indirect information flow in loops or if else conditions. When we now do our first refinement step, it's a composition here. We are writing, uh, writing what's a specific um, variables um, after executing S1 and before executing S2. And that can, can maybe be, so normally we should be sure what's here, but if we are running into a problem that can also be updated. So here we are knowing, okay, we will introduce a public variable I and the secret variable HP, what we are doing here. So they, so they are also here in the intermediate specification. And in the second step, we are iterating through the loop, but also, doing again before a composition to have like the loop and the declassify operation before. So here's the loop where we just check, okay, as long as E is smaller than the length of the array. And in the other part, we are um, yeah, declassifying and maybe afterwards printing our published bit. So this assignment here is allowed because um, yeah, highest bit is declassified the secret variable can be assigned to the public variable PB. And yeah, so now we are doing like um, the refinement of the loop. Here, we are using bits in the um, guard of the array. So we are knowing bits is a private element. So we are going here now in the private context. And now to not have any indirect information flow leaks, we can only use private or more secure variables inside of that loop body. If you would do like or use um, yeah, public elements, then we can have, um, and an attacker would read these public elements 
um, yeah, the attacker maybe get some information about the C uh, private area bits that we don't want. So we can not assign them. And in our um, in our loop, we have also do two steps. We have like the check of the current highest bit that we are doing here. And we have like the increment of i. So we're first doing like the, um, the check. So one is if the highest bit is smaller than bits i and the other one is like the else part. And here we are now in a secret context because highest bit is a secret variable. So we can assign bits at the element i to the secret variable hb. In the other case, it's a skip statement, so that's also allowed doing just nothing. And maybe an important part here, as you can see, is incrementing this i variable. So I introduced it, as you can also see here, as a public variable, but now we are in a private context. And this public variable i is now increased in a private context. So as you can see here, it's propagated and now a private variable and also in the end. So if you don't increment or yeah, increase the security level of i, we would have a leak, could have a leak. So our system checks that this don't occur. Okay, so I've just shown an example doing step by step, but what are the rules behind it? So as Ina started in the first part of our tutorial, we have like all of these refinement rules for assignment, for repetition and so on. And I will quickly give you an expression how these refinement rules are for information flow by construction approach. So we know, and these rules are, for example, when you have here an assignment rule and you have the functionally correct assignment or for functional correctness assignment rule, you can use both to ensure both properties when refining a program. So here, additionally to our specification for the functional correctness, we have like these functions to um, see the security level of the different um, variables before and after executing statement S. So when we know we find S to an, uh, to an assignment where we say, okay, X is equal to some expression E, this is allowed when there's two things. So first of all, all variables Y that are not X should stay the same. So the, uh, the security level uh, before and uh, now after and before executing statement S should be the same, but for element X, we have an update. So for element X, we need a least upper bound. So we need a security level that is um, has a higher security level that is, um, but not some. So we want to um, don't raise, for example, everything to top secret or a super cosmic top secret. So we want to um, search one security level that is high enough um, to don't have any leaks. And this is what would be uh, used by the least upper bound operation. And here, um, what are the specific conditions that we have to check? So in expression E, there could be some variables with some, with some specific security levels. So we collect all of these. We collect the, um, the security level of X before executing this datum, and we have our security context eta. And all of the, this combined should be um, our new security level X. And for example, if we want to assign um, X that is low and we assign in some secret information, we have to update X to be secure. For um, another rule, the repetition rule, we are doing the same. So we refine statement S to some loop. So we are introducing a guard and a, the loop body S1. And that is correct if the following um, fits. So we have like our statement S1, the loop body that should be secure and that is refined in the next steps. But we have an updated um, security context eta prime. And that one is computed by looking at all of these variables in the guard and the, all, um, the old security context eta. And here we also um, compute the least upper bound. So as you, for example, seen in the example, we had a secret uh, private security level used a secret variable um, in the guards and then we updated the security level also to be secret. The last one I want to show is method call. And here we want to show a simple one where we, that's also similar if we just substitute the method body into that call. So we refine our hot triple um, again with a method call with some parameters. And that is correct if we have like that specific method call um, 
yeah, written in another Cog program, for example, with a, a specific precondition and specific postcondition. And these A1 are the formal uh, actual parameters, and Z1 are the Z1 are the formal parameters. And this um, refinement is secure when for all of these parameters A1 and Z1 the following holds. Um, to call it, we have to ensure that, like, okay, the actual parameters must be of a security level lower than Z1, so we can always only increase it. So here that one checks, okay, at the start, our security levels fit. And in the end, when we um, executed our method call, we also check that the post condition here, our Z1s, the security level levels we get back are no lower or equal to the security levels that we want to continue with our program. So we only have like an increment of security levels, but never the unallowed opposite flow. So now um, the information flow control is also as um, that's the functional correctness implemented in the Cork tool. It's as you can, uh, as you have seen before, it's an eclipse plugin with this uh, um, textual and uh, graphical view. And the background keys used for the functional correctness and our other information flow rules are just implemented directly in the editor. And I will quickly show you the example from before, also in the editor. So here we have like um, the same algorithm of so looping through the array of bits and we want to compute the highest bit. So the algorithm is also shown here again to, um, yeah, for, for comparison. And yeah, as you can see, the algorithm is already verified correctly. So we've asked key and now we have a specific properties view here added at the bottom. And now we can see in each part, okay, what are the security levels of each variable before and after executing the statement. So for example, this uh, the interesting part here where we are know, okay, I is public before executing the statement. And afterwards, as we are in a private context, I has to be updated to private. Then other parts here, for example, we have seen like, okay, that was all correct. We have a secret context. We updated highest bidding. That was before and after secret. So everything is fine. And when we now change something in the code, this element would become uh, red. So we have to re-verify that the functional function or that is functional correct. And we can also see a different information flow example. And we know what write PB. That would here now edit as a private variable as we are in a private context. Yep, that would be like a quick view of the editor with the additional properties view to see the information flow. And yeah, to just conclude this part, I know I've just um, shown you like for the simple part, like I'm um, having the guarded command language. And now we are currently um, doing an, yeah, an extension where we also think about object oriented languages. So in this object orientation, we have a, a new problem that comes into, um, yeah, into the play. So we have objects that can have different aliases. So as you can see here in the example, we have an object O that is, has a low security. And we know, when we now have an alias with a high security level to the same object, update this object via the higher reference, writing something private in there, we still have the low reference to read this information. And that's the leak that would before not be, um, yeah, we wouldn't uh, see that. So we want to now think about like all these, these new problems of object oriented languages in case um, yeah, to check the information flow. And here we use um, some type modifiers to make it more easy to get um, uh, also programmers get more or uh, get a clearer re view what they're doing and what is allowed. So for example, if this object O would be immutable, you cannot change it. You wouldn't have this leak in the first place. So the set operation in this, in this third line wouldn't be allowed when it, the object is immutable. And yeah, we only have this immutable type modifier. We have also have a read modifier that says, okay, it's object, or that's the most restrictive one. The object cannot even be modified and there are no aliases to that object. 
then we have the mutable one. There, everything is allowed. You can modify the object. You can have aliases. There's um, yeah, information flow harder to track. With immutable, we know, OK, if it's the specific ob object was secure, we cannot change it. So any up or uh, so any changes of maybe of the security level are no problems. And the last part is capsule. So that's a specific modification that says, OK, I have an object and I have only one reference to that object. So it's um, yeah, like an isolated portion of store. And then you can update um, the object. You can change, I don't know, maybe with setters and getters, get information. But you still know in every step, OK, that's isolated. You can um, Nobody else can see that information. And when you want to share it, you can transform it to a mutable or immutable update. Um, immutable object and then include it to like um, yeah, bigger data, um, data graph, and then others can also interact with this capsule, op capsule object that is then mutable or immutable. And with these different type modifiers, we can um, yeah, deduce the information if um, an object-oriented program is secure or not. And now to conclude my talk or this part here, we have shown information flow by construction with all of these uh, refinement rules that uh, are check with any lattice of security levels if the information flows correct or not. That's implemented in the Cork tool that can now check the functional correctness and also the information flow parts. And for future work, this quick um, thing I've shown you where we extend it for object-oriented languages. Thank you very so, much, Tobias. Um, no. I still don't see any questions, so it seems like people do totally understand what we are talking about today. Um, shall I shall I take the screen back? I think yeah, would be more easy, right? Yeah, I guess so. Let's see. There we go. Now you should see my screen. There we go. Okay, so so just to finish off um, this this tutorial for the last uh, ten minutes or so, let me let me quickly sort of point you to sort of what traditional um, formal analysis is, and this is post hoc verification, and this is also the camp where I come from uh, before I got more involved in the in the whole CBC world. So usually, if you if you want to verify correctness of a program. Um, then you annotate it with pre and post conditions and class invariants, and usually you don't add enough specifications. Um, and then there are two, two main verification approaches. One is verification condition generation. Um, this is classical horse style, weak as preconditional reasoning usually. And then there is symbolic execution, what, uh, what the key system does that we are using as backend for, for web cork and cork as well. Um, and usually what postdoc verification does is um, you, you, write a, you write your program as you would normally write it. And then a postdoc verification prover uh, constructs a proof that um, your program conforms to that specification. And usually um, the, the problem with postdoc verification is when uh, you need to come up with the predicates and the annotations uh, for verification. And usually the difference in CBC is, and we hope that we could convince you of that uh, through the examples that we presented today, that usually CBC already results in well-structured code, uh, which is just a byproduct of, of the, the CBC-based, refinement-based development process. Um, and that all, already in CBC, we arrive at all the annotations that we need for the post hoc verification uh, proof tools. And also CBC allows the taxonomization of algorithmic families. So you have seen um, the, the simple pattern matching algorithm. Um, and there are many, many more pattern match matching algorithms. I think that Bruce is actually an expert on that. And then many of those algorithms have been derived using CBC. And then you get a nice structure of the algorithmic choices you can make in that taxonomy just by applying this refinement or that refinement, you get um, the taxonomy tree. And that allows you to reason about um, different, different ways of solving the same problem. So in, in that example, different ways of solving um, pattern matching problems, for instance. 
Um, formality, CBC, and in the way that that um, we find in, in Derek and Bruce's textbook, this is um, concerned with correctness and the intuitive level, because the mission of that book is to teach students mainly or, or software developers or programmers to think about correctness and to think about specification before they write that. Um, and of course, if, if those specifications are too informal and too hand wavy, we, we risk errors. And, and one of the observations that we made when started starting um, to build tools about five years ago, that we needed to make many, many of the CBC specifications much more formal um, in order to be able to, to reason about the correctness of refinements with a tool. Um, and, and that's what we see that sort of between the intuitive level of CBC and postdoc verification with, with tools, um, we see that those go well together um, in fact. So um, and the main drawback of CBC until until very recently, so until about five years ago, was lack of tool support. So CBC in the way of, of Dijkstra was was mostly a paper and paper and pencil exercise. And we spent quite some effort on, on developing um, tool support. And I think it's safe to say that Tobias is one of the or is the chief developer of the Cork um, Cork tool. And Cork is becoming um, bigger, so the Cork uh, tool support family. Um, we have tool support for not only for classical algorithms that that you have seen in, in Web Cork. Um, you have seen um, the full fledged standalone Eclipse version of Cork, which can do a little bit more than than Web Cork. It can do information flow by construction, and we also have um, a member of the family which is called Varcork which allows you to construct a variable software and software product lines using CBC. Um, and then we have a tool that is called Archicork, uh, which allows you to scale CBC to the, to the architecture level and to compose components um, and the, uh, correctly. So, so on the architecture level, we compose components um, and we ensure that the component composition, the architecture is correct. And then inside the components, you can develop your code uh, with Cork. So you can actually scale CBC and a very recent, very ongoing development is the new version Cork 2.0, which then um, extends what we do currently with classic Cork or Cork 1.0 also to object oriented programs. And that allows us to also do correctness by construction for state. And, and traditionally sort of CBC and postdoc verification were, were like um, sort of opposing camps. Um, and many of my postdoc verification friends approached me when I, when I got into this research direction saying like CBC is never going to work. Um, and I think we proved them wrong, at least partially, even though there's lots of work to do. And of course, there is a way how to combine and integrate CBC and postdoc verification um, such that uh, both can contribute their, their strengths. So for instance, uh, what we envision is that we use CBC to derive al elegant algorithmic um, solutions um, that we translate that program then into a programming language for a postdoc verification tool. Um, then we tr also translate the annotations and then we can use the postdoc verification prover to also um, proof the, the CBC derived program in case we need formal arguments um, for that specific algorithm. Uh, just to summarize, uh, we think the advantages of, of CBC are that we have well-structured code, that we can build algorithmic families, uh, taxonomies of those, um, that we save testing effort and um, lots of um, effort on quality assurance. And I have one anecdote or anecdotal evidence of, the, of that and also that CBC allows faster time to market. Of course, the disadvantages, sometimes it's too intuitive. Um, we are still sort of working on extending the tool support. Um, and that's one of the main um, keys to, to, at least we think, uh, to apply CBC more widely. Um, currently, we are thinking of applying CBC also in other domains. So what you have seen so far here was, was mainly 
classical algorithmics, but of course CVC would have a cutting edge if we look at parallel or cloud-based programming, uh, which is of course notoriously difficult, um, then correctness by construction for, for data flow languages such as MATLAB Simulink. Um, and we already went a bit of the way on CVC for, for software product lines and variability. And of course, the, the ingredients that you need for that is a formal language syntax and a formal specification language. And um, this is sometimes difficult for languages like MATLAB Simulink, which don't have a formal semantics or where the code generator is um, a way to express the semantics. Um, another problem is um, specification languages for, for parallel programs. Um, which uh, where there's still still some research to do, and then of course you need refinement rules, as Tobias have shown has shown how we transferred sort of the classical um, CBC refinement rules for functional correctness to to information flow, um, and um, if you if you want to apply CBC to other domains, that's essentially the step you have to do for the program constructs um, in in that domain. And um, Bruce, I'm not sure if you are still there. Um, if you want to tell the story or if I should, should tell the story. So some anecdotal evidence that, that CBC does actually, actually scale and it's not just a, a textbooks exercise. That is a story that um, uh, comes from a large semiconductor manufacturing company where they are building soft simulation software for their hardware they built. Um, and in that setting, they actually applied the ideas of, of CBC. And um, I mean, this is not a controlled experiment, but it's, it's more like anecdotal evidence. But I think it's quite compelling that um, using CBC in the development process for that uh, simulation um, software reduced the time um, of, of testing uh, by a factor of 10. Um, the, the size of the team was reduced by a factor of three and um, they arrived at cleaner and more maintainable code. Of course, that requires CBC skills on the team. Um, and sometimes people um, who, are, who are questioning the usefulness of CBC say like, look, this is all too complex and this is all too, too formal. But if, the, if I look at some other work that engineers or other formalism that engineers look at, like differential equations, then I think it's, it, this is not necessarily um, more difficult. Um, it's just that you, that you need to get used to it and uh, you need to get the hang um, of, of the way of thinking in, in the CBC fashion. So um, we try to convince you in, in this um, tutorial that uh, CBC should be more widely used and also should be taught more widely. This is what we are doing um, in, um, at, at TU Braunschweig at um, the University of Eindhoven and also in Stellenbosch and elsewhere. And we try to convince people as often as possible that uh, CBC is a good idea to use. And I hope that uh, you could also take something out of, out of our tutorial today. Um, and this last slide is various references of our work uh, where we have published um, the, the results and the things that we talked about today. And is there a question? Yes, do you see any a, questions? Yeah. Okay. I was just going to say you gave a very good explanation and I couldn't get back off uh, mute fast enough to give a okay. better one, which I'm thankful that you gave. <laughs> but, but you can add to that anecdotal evidence that it actually works also in practice, even though we in, couldn't indeed. show the big examples. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, the payoff uh, obviously is in, in the long run, you know, you it's, it's not a methodology for, um, for one-off projects and, uh, or for throwaway code. You know, it, admittedly, you know, a lot of web dev, um, it would be an inappropriate use of resources for, um, for CBC, but anything that might go into a library is, is definitely a candidate, you know, before it's um, embedded in many, many other kinds of software, data structure libraries, but also crypto, um, 
security libraries and so on. But also, I mean, talking about throwaway software and Jupyter notebooks, I mean, it would also be good in data science projects, right, to think about correctness before hacking stuff. Um, in particular, if we think that we base political decisions on epidemiological data that might be crunched one way or the other way. So I, I have a better feeling um, if, if that's correct. So it's not... No, not code that looks like, no, well, not every code that looks like a throwaway code um, doesn't need correctness. No. Agreed, very much agreed. CBC for R and Python. Yeah, that's a project I would like to do. More, more R than Python. Good, with that, we have reached the end of three hours and whoever worried that we didn't have enough to say has also been proven wrong. Um, do you guys see any questions? I don't see anything anymore. No. Good. Then what's left to say, um, thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, thanks to Luke in the background, um, my wonderful co-speakers and uh, thanks for, for your time and the preparation. Um, thank you very much to, to SECDEF for giving us the, the possibility to try to evangelize more people of, of the usefulness of CBC. Of course, it would have been way more fun um, some in person, but maybe we can do a repeat in, in 2020 or 2023 um, in person. And um, yeah, thanks to the audience for your patience and for, for staying. Um, I will be monitoring the, the Slack channel, I think Tobias and I, um, also for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, if there are any more questions, and we are all happy to, to answer questions afterwards, um, you can reach us via email or via Slack. And with that, enjoy the rest of your conference. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much. We'll return here at 1 p.m. for the next tutorial.